Blood of the Fold by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 263. Anne, you said I must find out who are sworn to the keeper. I have no idea how to do this. Can you help? If I knew how to do it, Verna, I would tell you. A few made me suspect them, but most did not. I was never able to find a way to divine who were the keepers. I have other matters I must deal with, so I must leave this one to you to solve. Keep in mind that they can be as clever as the keeper himself. Some, who I was certain were against us because of their disagreeable nature, were loyal to us. Some who revealed themselves and escaped on the ship, I would have trusted with my life. I would be dead now, had I. Anne, I don't know how to do this. What if I fail? You must not fail. Verna wiped her sweaty palms on her dress. But even if I can find a way to identify them, then what am I to do with this information? I cannot fight sisters with the power they have. Once you accomplish the first part, Verna, I will tell you, know that the prophecies are vulnerable to tampering and in danger. Just as Nathan and I use them to help us influence events so as to take the proper fork, so too can our enemies use them. Verna sighed in frustration. How can I work to identify our enemies when there is so much work to do as prelate? All I do is read reports, and yet I fall farther and farther behind. Everyone is depending on me and waiting on me. How did you find the time to accomplish anything with all the reports? You read the reports? My goodness, Verna, but you are ambitious. You certainly are more conscientious as prelate than I. Verna's mouth dropped open. You mean that I don't have to read the reports? Well, Verna, look at the value in reading them. Because you read the reports, you discovered that the horses were missing from the stables. We could have easily bought horses after we left the palace, but took those instead so as to leave a sign. We could have paid for the bodies instead of going through the complicated arrangements we did, but then you wouldn't have been able to talk to the gravedigger. We took care to leave signs you could follow so as to discover the truth. Some of the signs we left were quite troublesome, such as the one with the discovery of our bodies, but were necessary, and you did a good job in figuring it out. Verna felt her face flush. She had never thought to look into the matter of the bodies being discovered already prepared and in winding sheets. She had completely missed that clue. But I must confess, Anne went on, that I hardly ever bothered to read reports. That is what assistants are for. I simply told them that they were to use their judgment and wisdom, and in keeping with the best interest of the palace, handle the matters involved in the reports. Then every once in a while I would stop before them and pull out some reports that they had dealt with and read their disposition. It always kept them diligent in their task, for fear I would read their instructions given in my name and find them unsatisfactory. Verna was astonished. You mean to say that I can simply tell my assistants or advisors how I wish matters managed and then have them handle the reports? I don't have to read them all? I don't have to initial them all? Verna, you are prelate. You can do as you wish. You run the palace. It does not run you. But sisters Leoma and Philippa, my advisors, and Alcinia, one of my administrators, all told me how it must be done. They are so much more experienced than I. They made it seem I would be failing the palace were I not to handle the reports myself. Did they now? Anne wrote almost instantly. My, my. I think that if I were you, Verna, I would do a bit less listening and a little more talking. You have a fine scowl. Use it. Verna grinned at that. Already she was picturing the scene. There were going to be some changes in the prelate's office come morning. Anne, what is your mission? What are you trying to accomplish? I have a small task in Aidendrill, and then I hope to return. It was plain that Anne wasn't going to tell her, so Verna thought about what else she wanted to know and what she needed to tell the prelate. One thing of importance came to mind. Warren gave a prophecy. His first, he said. There was a long pause. Verna waited. When the message finally came, its hand was a bit more carefully drawn. Do you remember it, word for word? Verna could not forget a word of that prophecy. Yes. Before Verna could begin to write the prophecy, a message suddenly began to splash across the page. The scrawl was huge and angry, the letters drawn in big blocks. Get that boy out of the palace. Get him out. A line snaked across the page. Verna sat up straighter. It was obvious that Nathan had taken the stylus away from Anne and had written the message, and Anne was in the process of getting it back. 
There was another long pause, and at last Anne's handwriting appeared again. Sorry. Verna, if you are certain that you remember the prophecy word for word, then write it down so we may see it. If you are unsure of any of it, tell me. This is important. I remember it word for word as it pertains to me, Verna wrote. It says, When the prelate and the prophet are given to the light in the sacred rite, the flames will bring to boil a cauldron of guile and give ascension to a false prelate who will reign over the death of the palace of the prophets. To the north, the one bonded to the blade will abandon it for the silver sliff, for he will breathe her back to life, and she will deliver him into the arms of the wicked. There was another pause. Hold, please, while Nathan and I study this. Verna sat and waited. The bugs outside chirped and the frogs peeped. Verna stood, keeping an eye to the book, and stretched her back as she yawned. Still, there was no message. She sat and rested her chin in her fist, and her eyes drooped as she waited. At last, a message began to appear. Nathan and I have been going over this, and Nathan says that it is an immature prophecy, and because of that he cannot fully decipher it. And I am the false prelate. It troubles me greatly that this prophecy says I will reign over the death of the palace. An immediate message came back. You are not the false prelate in this prophecy. Then what does it mean? There was a shorter pause this time. We do not know its full meaning, but we do know that you are not the false prelate named in it. Verna, listen carefully. Warren must leave the palace. It is too dangerous for him to remain any longer. He must go into hiding. He could be seen leaving in the night. Tomorrow morning, have him go into the city on the pretense of an errand. In the confusion of people, it will be hard for anyone to follow him. Have him get away through that confusion. Give him gold so he will not have any trouble doing what he needs. Verna put a hand to her heart as she gulped a breath. She bent back over the book. But prelate, Warren is the only one I can trust. I need him. I don't know the prophecies like he does and will be lost without him. She left unsaid that he was her only friend, the only friend she could trust. Verna, the prophecies are in danger. If they get their hands on a prophet, the hastily scribbled message halted abruptly. After a moment, it resumed, more carefully written. He must get away. Do you understand? Yes, prelate. I will see to it first thing in the morning. Warren will do as I ask. I will trust in your instructions that it is more important for him to leave than to aid me. Thank you, Verna. Anne, what is the danger to the prophecies? She waited a moment in the quiet of the sanctuary until the writing began again. Just as we try to help our effort by knowing the danger down various forks in prophecy, so too can those who wish to rule mankind use this information to guide events down forks they want to come to pass. Used in this fashion, the prophecies can defeat us. If they have a prophet, they can have a better understanding of the prophecies and how to direct events to their advantage. Tampering with forks can invoke chaos that even they don't expect and can't control. This is dangerous in the extreme. They could inadvertently walk us all off a cliff. Anne, are you saying that Jagang is going to try to take the Palace of the Prophets and the prophecies in the vaults? Pause. Yes. Verna paused herself. The realization of the nature of the struggle ahead came over her in icy goosebumps. How can we stop him? The Palace of the Prophets cannot fall so easily as Jagang thinks. Though he is a dreamwalker, we have control of our Han. That power is also a weapon. Though we have always used our gift to preserve life and help bring the Creator's light to the world, a time may come when we have to use our gift to fight. For this we must know who is loyal to us. You must find out who is untainted. Verna thought carefully before she began to write. Anne, do you intend to call upon us to become warriors, to use our gift to strike down the Creator's children? I am telling you, Verna, that you will have to use what you know to help prevent the world from being taken forever into the darkness of tyranny. Though we struggle to help the Creator's children, we also carry a dacra, don't we? We can't help people if we are dead. Verna rubbed her thighs when she realized they were trembling. She had killed people, and the prelate knew it. She had killed Jedediah. She wished she had brought something to drink. Her throat felt as if it were turning dry as dust. I understand, she wrote at last. I will do what I must. I wish I could give you better guidance, Verna, but right now I don't know enough. 
Events are already rushing ahead in a torrent. Without direction and probably on sheer instinct, Richard has already taken precipitous action. We are not sure what he is up to, but from what I gather, he already has the Midlands in an uproar. The boy doesn't rest for a minute. He seems to make up his own rules as he goes. What has he done? Verna asked, fearing the answer. He has somehow taken command of Dahara and has captured Aidendril. He has declared the Midlands Alliance dissolved and demanded the surrender of all lands. Verna gasped. It is the Midlands that must fight the Imperial Order. Has he lost his mind? We can't afford to have him bring Dahara and the Midlands to war. He has already done it. The Midlands isn't going to surrender to him. From what I gather, Galia and Kelton are already in his fist. He must be stopped. The Imperial Order is the threat. It is they who must be fought. We can't allow him to start a war in the New World. The diversion could be fatal. Verna, magic is marbled through the Midlands like a juicy roast. The Imperial Order will steal that roast one slice at a time as they did the Old World. Timid alliances will balk at starting a conflagration over one slice and let it go instead. Then the next slice will be taken in the name of appeasement and peace, and then the next, all the while weakening the Midlands and strengthening the Order. While you were gone on your journey, they took all of the Old World in less than 20 years. Richard is a war wizard. It is his instincts that guide him, and everything he has learned and holds dear forge his actions. We have no choice but to trust him. In the past, the threat was a single individual, like Dark and Rao. In this, it is a monolithic threat. Even if we could somehow eliminate Jagang, another would take his place. This is a battle of beliefs, fears, and ambitions of all people, not a single leader. It is much the same as the way people fear the palace. If a leader came to the fore, we would not eliminate the threat by eliminating the leader. The fear would still be in people's heads, and taking their leader would only intensify their belief that they are justified in their fear. Dear Creator, Werner wrote back, then what are we to do? There was a pause for a time. As I said, child, I don't have all the answers, but I can tell you this. In this, the final trial, we all play a part, but it is Richard who is the key. Richard is our leader. I don't agree with all the things he does, but he is the only one who can lead us to victory. If we are to prevail, we must follow him. I am not saying we cannot try to advise and guide him in what we know, but he is a war wizard, and this is the war he was born to fight. Nathan has warned that there is a place in the prophecies called the Great Void. If we end on this fork, he believes that there is nothing beyond for magic, and thus no prophecy illuminating it. Mankind will go off forever into that unknown without magic. Jagang wishes to take the world into that void. Remember this above all else. No matter what, you must remain loyal to Richard. You can talk to him, advise him, reason with him, but you must not fight him. Loyalty to Richard is the only thing keeping Jagang from your mind. Once a dreamwalker has your mind, you are lost to our side. Verna swallowed. The stylus shook in her hand. I understand. Is there anything I can do to help? For now, the things I have already told you. You must act quickly. The war has already charged ahead of us. I hear there are Mriswith in Aidendril. Verna's eyes opened wide at the last of the message. Dear Creator, she said aloud, give Richard strength. Chapter 31 Verna squinted in the light. The sun was just up. She groaned as she rose from the overstuffed chair and stretched her cramped muscles. She had corresponded with the prelate late into the night, and then, too tired to go to her bed, had curled up in the chair and fallen asleep. After Verna had heard about Richard and the Mriswith in Aidendril, the two had written back and forth about palace business. The prelate answered countless questions Verna asked about the running of the palace, the way things worked, and how to handle her advisors, administrators, and other sisters. The lessons Anne imparted were eye-opening. Verna had never realized the extent of palace politics and how nearly every facet of palace life and law revolved around it. A prelate's power was derived in part from making the correct alliances and using duties and power carefully assigned to control opposition. Divided into factions, responsible for their own niche and given wide leeway in narrowly defined areas, 
the more influential sisters were diverted from joining in opposition to the prelate. Information was granted or withheld in a carefully controlled process, keeping opposing groups balanced in influence and power. This balance kept the prelate the pivot point and in control of palace objectives. Though the sisters couldn't remove a prelate from office except for treason against the palace and creator, they could mire the workings of the palace in petty bickering and power struggles. The prelate had to control that energy and focus it to worthwhile goals. It seemed that running the palace, doing the creator's work, was really handling personalities and their attendant feelings and sensibilities rather than simply assigning tasks that needed to be done. Verna had never viewed the running of the palace in this way. She had always seen them as one happy family, all intent on the Creator's work, running smoothly on direction from the prelate. That, she had learned, had been because of the deft handling of the sisters by the prelate. Because of her, they all worked to a purpose, seeming to Verna to be satisfied with their part in the scheme of things. After the talk with Annalena, Verna felt even more inadequate at her post, but at the same time more prepared to rise to the task. She had never known the vast extent of the prelate's knowledge about the most trivial of palace matters. It was no wonder that prelate Annalena had made the job look so easy. She was a master at it, a juggler who could keep a dozen balls in the air at once while smiling and patting a novice on the head. Verna rubbed her eyes as she yawned. She had gotten only a few hours sleep, but she had work to do and couldn't lie about any longer. She tucked the journey book, all its pages wiped clean, back into her belt and headed back to her office, stopping along the way to splash water from the pond on her face. A pair of green ducks swam closer, interested in what she was doing mucking about in their world. They circled about a bit before deciding to preen themselves, apparently content that she had no interest other than to share their water. The sky was a glorious pink and violet in the new day, the air clean and fresh. Though deeply worried about what she had learned, she also felt optimistic. Like everything around her in the light of the new day, she felt as if her mind had been enlightened too. Verna shook the water from her hands as she fretted about how she was going to discover which sisters were sworn to the keeper. Just because the prelate had faith in her and had ordered it, that didn't mean she would succeed. She sighed and then kissed the prelate's ring, asking the creator to please help her figure out a way. Verna couldn't wait to tell Warren about the prelate and all the things she had learned in talking with her. But she was heavy-hearted, too, because she was going to have to ask him to go into hiding. She didn't know how she was going to manage without him. Maybe if he was able to find a safe place not too far, she could still visit him occasionally and not feel so alone. In her office, Verna smiled when she saw the teetering stacks of waiting reports. She left the doors to the garden open to let in the cool morning air and let out the stale air of her office. She began straightening the reports, shuffling the papers into order and making the stacks straight, lining them up along the edge. For the first time, she was able to see some of the wood of the tabletop. Verna looked up when the door opened. Phoebe and Dulcinea, each carrying more reports in the crook of an arm, both started when they saw her. Good morning, Verna said in a bright voice. Forgive us, prelate, Dulcinea said. Her penetrating blue eyes caught when she saw the neat stack of reports. We didn't realize the prelate would be at work so early. We didn't mean to interrupt. We can see that you have a lot of work to do. We'll just put these down with the others, if we may. Oh, yes, please do, Verna said, holding an inviting hand out toward her desk. Leoma and Philippa will be pleased you brought them to me. Prelate, Phoebe said, her round face set in puzzlement. Oh, you know what I mean. My advisors, of course, like to make sure the palace runs as smooth as a new greased wheel. Leoma and Philippa fret over the task. Task? Dulcinea asked, her frown growing. The reports, Verna said, as if it should be obvious. They wouldn't want one so new at the job as you two to be undertaking such responsibility. Maybe if you continue to work hard and prove yourselves, I will someday trust you with them. If they think it wise, of course. Dulcinea's frown darkened. What did Philippa say, prelate? What aspect of my experience does she find inadequate? Verna shrugged. Don't misunderstand me, sister. My advisors haven't derided you in any way. They are most scrupulous about praising you, in fact. It's just that they've made it clear that the reports are important and have urged me to see to them myself. I'm sure they will come around in a few years and have the confidence to advise me when you are ready. Ready for what? Phoebe asked in bewilderment. 
Verna waggled her hand toward the stacks of reports. Well, it's the duty of the prelate's administrators to read the reports and dispose of them. The prelate only needs to occasionally oversee the disposition to confirm that her administrators are doing a proper job. Since my advisors urged me to handle the reports myself, I assumed it was obvious that they... Well, I'm sure they meant no offense, seeing as how they always compliment the both of you. Verna clicked her tongue. Though they do then go on to remind me that I should handle the reports myself in the best interest of the palace. Dulcinea stiffened with indignation. We already read those reports, every one to make sure they're in order. We know more about them than anyone. The Creator knows I see those reports in my sleep. We know when something is amiss and note it for you, don't we? We bring tellies to your attention when they don't reconcile, don't we? Those two have no business telling you that you must do it yourself. Verna strolled to a bookshelf, busying herself with a fictitious search for a particular volume. I'm sure they only have the best interest of the palace in mind, sister. You being so new at the post and all, I think you read too much into their advice. I'm as old as Philippa. I have as much experience as she. Sister, she made no accusation, Verna said in her most humble tone as she glanced over her shoulder. She advised you to handle the reports, didn't she? Well, yes, but she's wrong. The both of them are wrong. They are? Verna asked, turning away from the bookcase. Of course. Dulcinea looked to Phoebe. We could have those reports, the whole lot of them, worked, ordered, assessed, and ruled on in a matter of a week or two, couldn't we, Sister Phoebe? Phoebe lifted her nose. I should think we could have it done in under a week. We know more about how to handle those reports than anyone. Her face flushed as she glanced at Verna. Except you, of course, Prelate. Really? It's a huge responsibility. I wouldn't want to put you in over your heads. You have only been at the jobs a short time. Do you think you are already seasoned enough? Dulcinea huffed. I should say we are. She marched to the desk and scooped up a huge stack. We'll see about this. You just come and check any we've done, and you'll find you would have handled matters in the exact same manner we do. We know what we're doing, you'll see, she scowled. And those two will see, too. Well, if you really think you can handle it, I'm willing to give you a chance. You are my administrators, after all. I should say we are. Dulcinea tilted her head toward the desk. Phoebe, grab a stack. Phoebe lifted a large column of reports, staggering back a step to keep them balanced. I'm sure the prelate has more important matters to attend to than doing work her administrators can just as easily handle. Verna folded her hands at her belt. Well, I did appoint you because I believed in your abilities. I guess it only fair that I allow you to prove them. After all, a prelate's administrators are of vital importance to the running of the palace. Dulcinea's lips spread in a cunning smile. You'll see just how vital we are to helping you, prelate, and so will your advisors. Verna lifted her eyebrows. I'm already impressed, sisters. Well, I do have some matters to look into. What with being so busy with reports, I've not had a chance to check up on my advisors and make sure that they're handling their duties properly. I guess it's about time I did that. Yes, Dulcinea said, as she followed Phoebe out the door. I think that would be wise. Verna let out a huge sigh when the door closed. She had thought she would never see the end of those reports. She gave a mental thank you to Prelate Annalina. She realized she was grinning and straightened her face. Warren didn't answer her knock, and when she peeked into his room, she saw his bed didn't look slept in. Verna winced when she remembered that she had ordered him to the vaults to link up those prophecies. Poor Warren had probably been sleeping with his books, doing as she had commanded. She recalled with shame how she had spoken to him when she had been so angry after her talk with the gravedigger. Now she was relieved and overjoyed to know that the prelate and Nathan were alive, but at the same time she had been livid and had taken it out on Warren. Instead of causing a stir, she descended the stairs and corridors without an escort to empty the vaults for her. She thought it would be safer if she were to simply pay a short visit to the vaults on a minor inspection and tell Warren to come to her at their meeting spot by the river. This information was far too dangerous to convey, even in the safety of the empty vaults. Maybe Warren would come up with an idea of how they could unmask the Sisters of the Dark. Warren's cleverness was surprising at times. She kissed her ring in an attempt to banish the anguish when she remembered her duty to send him away. She had to get him away at once. 
With a sad smile, she thought that maybe he could get some wrinkles on his annoyingly smooth face and catch up with her while she remained under the palace's spell. Sister Becky, her pregnancy becoming obvious to all, was lecturing a group of older novices on the intricacies of prophecy. She was pointing out the danger of false prophecy because of forks that had been taken in the past. Once an event in a prophecy had taken place, and if it carried an either-or fork, then the prophecy had been resolved by events. One branch of the fork had proven true, and the other branch then became a false prophecy. The difficulty was that yet other prophecies were linked to each branch, but when they were given, it wasn't yet decided which fork would come to pass. Once resolved, any prophecy linked to the dead branch became false too, but because it was often impossible to determine which fork many prophecies were linked to, the vaults were clogged with this dead wood. Verna moved to the back wall and listened for a time as the novices asked questions. It was frustrating for them to learn the scope of the problems facing one trying to work with prophecy, and how many of the things they asked had no answer. Verna now knew from what Warren had told her that the sisters had even less understanding of the prophecies than they thought. Prophecy was really meant to be interpreted by a wizard whose gift possessed that aptitude. In the last thousand years, Nathan was the only wizard they had come across who had the ability to give prophecy. She now knew that he understood them in a way no sister had ever known, except perhaps prelate Annalena. She now knew that Warren, too, had that latent talent for prophecy. As Sister Becky went on with an explanation of linkage through key events and chronology, Verna quietly moved off toward the back rooms where Warren usually worked, but found them all empty, and their books returned to the shelves. Verna puzzled over where to look next. It had never been difficult to find Warren, but that was because he was almost always in the vaults. Sister Leoma met her as she was returning up the aisles between the long rows of shelves. Her advisor smiled in greeting and bowed her head of long, straight white hair tied behind with a golden ribbon. Verna detected worry in the creases of her face. Good morning, prelate. The Creator's blessing on this new day. Verna returned the warm smile. Thank you, sister. A fine day it is, too. How are the novices doing? Leoma glanced off toward the tables with the young women sitting around it in concentration. They will make fine sisters. I've been observing the lessons, and there's not an inattentive one in the lot. Without returning her gaze to Verna, she asked, Have you come to find Warren? Verna twisted the ring on her finger. Yes. There were a few matters I thought to ask him to check for me. Have you seen him about? When Leoma turned back at last, her creases had deepened into true concern. Verna, I'm afraid Warren is not here. I see. Well, do you know where I could find him? She let out a deep breath. What I mean, Verna, is that Warren is gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone? Sister Leoma's gaze drifted away to the shadows among the shelves. I mean he has left the palace for good. Verna's mouth dropped open. Are you sure? You must be mistaken. Perhaps you... Leoma smoothed back a wisp of white hair. Verna, he came to me night before last and told me he was leaving. Verna wet her lips. Why didn't he come to me? Why wouldn't he tell the prelate that he was leaving? Leoma drew her shawl tighter. Verna, I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, but he said you and he had words, and he thought that it would be for the best if he were to leave the palace, for now at least. He made me promise that I wouldn't tell you for a couple of days so he could be away. He didn't want you coming after him. Coming after him! Verna's fists tightened. What makes him think... Verna's head was spinning, trying to understand and suddenly trying to call back words that were days ago uttered. But did he say when he would be back? The palace needs his talent. He knows about the books down here. He can't just up and leave. Leoma glanced away again. I'm sorry, Verna, but he's gone. He said that he didn't know when or if he would return. He said that he thought it would be for the best and that you would come to see that too. Did he say anything else? She whispered hopefully. She shook her head. And you just let him go? Didn't you try to stop him? Verna, Leoma said in a gentle tone. Warren had his collar off. You yourself released him from his Radahan. We can't force a wizard to remain at the palace against his will when you've released him. He is a free man. It is his choice, not ours. It all came over her in an icy wave of tingling dread. She had released him. 
How could she expect him to remain to help her when she treated him in such a humiliating fashion? He was her friend, and she had dressed him down as if he were a first-year boy. He was not a boy. He was a man, his own man. And now he was gone. Verna forced herself to speak. Thank you, Leoma, for telling me. Leoma nodded, and after giving Verna's shoulder a squeeze of reassurance, walked back toward the lessons in the distance. Warren was gone. Reason told her that the Sisters of the Dark might have taken him, but in her heart she could only blame herself. Verna's faltering steps bore her to one of the little rooms, and after the stone door had closed, she sank weakly into a chair. Her head fell into her arms, and she began to weep, realizing only now how much Warren had meant to her. Chapter 32 Kaylin leaped out of the wagon bed, rolling through the snow when she landed. She sprang to her feet and scrambled toward the shrieks as rocks still crashed down around her, rebounding into the trees on the low side of the narrow trail, snapping branches and thudding into the huge trunks of the old pines. She jammed her back against the side of the wagon. Help me! She screamed to men already in a dead run toward her. Arriving only seconds after her, they threw themselves up against the wagon, taking up the weight. The man cried out louder. Wait, wait, wait! It sounded like they were killing him. Just hold it there. Don't lift anymore. The half-dozen young soldiers strained to hold the wagon where it was. The rock that had piled down on top had added considerably to the burden. Orsk, she called out. Yes, mistress, Kalen started. In the darkness, she hadn't seen the big one-eyed Daharan soldier standing right behind her. Orsk, help them hold the wagon up. Don't lift it. Just hold it still. She turned to the dark trail behind as Orsk muscled his way in beside the others and clamped his massive hands onto the lower edge of the wagon. Zed! Somebody get Zed! Hurry! Pushing her long hair back over her wolfhide mantle, Kaylin knelt beside the young man under the axle hub. It was too dark to see how badly he was injured, but by his panting grunts, she feared it was serious. She couldn't figure out why he had cried out louder when they started to lift the weight off him. Kalin found his hand and took it in both of hers. Hold on, Stevens. Help's coming. She grimaced when he crushed her hand in his grip as he let out a wail. He clutched her hand as if he were hanging from a cliff, and her hand was the only thing keeping him from falling into death's dark grasp. She vowed that she would not take her hand back even if he broke it. Forgive me, my queen, for slowing us. It was an accident. It wasn't your doing. His legs squirmed in the snow. Try to stay still. With her free hand, she brushed hair back from his brow. He quieted a bit at her touch, so she held the hand to the side of his icy face. Please, Stevens, try to be still. I won't let them put the weight down on you, I promise. We'll get you out from under there in just a moment, and the wizard will set you back to right. She could feel him nod under her hand. No one near had a torch and in the feeble moonlight ghosting through the thick branches, she couldn't see what the problem was. It seemed that lifting the wagon caused him more pain than when it was on him. Kalin heard a horse galloping up and saw a dark figure leap off as the horse skidded to a halt, twisting its head against the pull of the reins. When the man hit the ground, a flame ignited in his upturned, stick-like hand, lighting his thin face and mass of wavy white hair sticking out in disarray. Zed, hurry! When Kaylin looked down in the sudden harsh illumination, she saw the extent of the problem and felt a wave of nausea surge up like a hot hammer. Zed's calm, hazel eyes glided over the scene in quick appraisal as he knelt on the other side of Stevens. The wagon grazed a piling timber holding back the scree, she explained. The trail was narrow and treacherous, and in the darkness on the curve, they hadn't seen the piling in the snow. The timber must have been old and rotted. When the hub bumped it, the timber snapped, and the beam it had supported tumbled down, allowing a sluice of rock to come down on them. As the rock drove the back of the wagon sideways, the iron rim of the rear wheel caught in a frozen rut beneath the snow, and the spokes of the rear wheel snapped. The hub knocked Stevens from his feet and came down atop him. Kalen could now see in the light that one of the splintered spokes jutting from the hub canted at the end of the broken axle, had impaled the young man. When they tried to hoist the wagon, it lifted him by that spoke driven at an angle up under his ribs. I'm sorry, Kalen, 
Zed said. What do you mean you're sorry? You must... Kaylin realized that although her hand still throbbed, the grip on it had gone slack. She looked down and saw the mask of death. He was now in the spirit's hands. The pall of death sent a shudder through her. She knew what it was to feel the touch of death. She felt it now. She felt it every waking moment. In sleep, it saturated her dreams with its numb touch. Her icy fingers reflexively brushed at her face, trying to wipe away the ever-present tingle, almost like a hair tickling her flesh. But there was never anything there to brush away. It was the teasing touch of magic of the death spell that she felt. Zed stood letting the flame float to a torch that a man nearby was holding out, igniting it into wavering flame. While Zed held one hand out as if in command to the wagon, he motioned the men away with his other. They cautiously took their shoulders away, but remained poised to catch the wagon if it suddenly fell again. Zed turned his palm up, and in harmony with his arm's movement, the wagon obediently rose into the air another couple of feet. Pull him out, Zed ordered in a somber tone. The men seized Stevens by his shoulders and hauled him off the spoke. When he was out from under the axle, Zed turned his hand over and allowed the wagon to settle to the ground. A man fell to his knees beside Kalen. It's my fault, he cried in anguish. I'm sorry. Oh, dear spirits, it's my fault. Kalen gripped the driver's coat and urged him to his feet. If it's anyone's fault, then I'm to blame. I shouldn't have been trying to make distance in the dark. I should have... It's not your fault. It was an accident, that's all. She turned away, closing her eyes, still hearing the phantoms of his screams. As was their routine, they hadn't used torches so as not to reveal their presence. There was no telling what eyes might see a force of men moving through the passes. While there was no evidence of pursuit, it was foolhardy to be overconfident. Stealth was life. Bury him as best you can, Kalen told the men. There would be no digging in the frozen ground, but at least they could use the rock from the scree to cover him. His soul was with the spirits and safe now. His suffering was over. Zed asked the officers to get the trail cleared and then went with the men to find a place to lay Stevens to rest. Amid the mounting noise and activity, Kalin suddenly remembered Cyrilla and climbed back into the wagon bed. Her half-sister was wrapped in a heavy layer of blankets and nestled among piles of gear. Most of the rock had fallen in the back of the wagon, missing her, and the blanket had protected her from the smaller stones. The pile of gear didn't stop. It was a wonder that no one had been crushed by one of the larger boulders that had crashed down in the darkness. They had put Cyrilla in the wagon instead of the coach because she was still unconscious, and they thought that in the wagon they could lay her down so she would be more comfortable. The wagon was probably beyond repair. They would have to put her in the coach now. But it wasn't far. In the bottleneck in the trail, men started gathering, some squeezing past at officers' instructions and moving on into the night, while others brought out axes to cut trees and repair the support wall, while still others were told to throw the small stones and roll the larger rocks from the trail so they could get the coach through. Kalin was relieved to see that Cyrilla was unhurt by any of the rocks, and relieved, too, that she was still in her near-constant stupor. They didn't need Cyrilla's screams and cries of terror at the moment. There was work to be done. Kaylin had been riding in the wagon with her in case she happened to wake. After what had been done to her back in Aden Drill, Cyrilla panicked at the sight of men, becoming terrified and inconsolable if Kaylin, Addie, or Jebra wasn't there to calm her. In her rare spells of lucidity, Cyrilla made Kaylin promise over and over that she would be queen. Cyrilla worried for her people and knew that she was in no state to help them. She loved Galia enough to refuse to burden her land with a queen in no condition to lead them. Kaelin had reluctantly assumed the responsibility. Kaelin's half-brother, Prince Harold, wanted nothing to do with the monarchical burden. He was a soldier, as was his and Cyrilla's father, King Wyborn. After Cyrilla and Harold had been born, Kaelin's mother had taken King Wyborn as her mate, and Kaelin was born. She was born a confessor, the magic of the confessors took precedence over petty matters of royalty. How is she? Zed asked, as he tugged his robes off a snag while climbing into the wagon. The same. She was unhurt by the rockfall. Zed put fingers to her temples for a moment. There is nothing wrong with her body, but the sickness still holds rain over her mind. He shook his head with a sigh as he rested an arm on his knee. I wish the gift could cure maladies of the mind. 
Kaylin saw the frustration in his eyes. She smiled. Be thankful. If you could, you would never have time to eat. As Zed chuckled, she glanced to the men around the wagon and saw Captain Ryan. She gestured him closer. Yes, my queen. How far to Ebenissia? Four, maybe six hours. Zed leaned toward her. Not a place we want to reach in the dead of the night. Kalin caught his meaning and nodded. For them, to reclaim the crown city of Galea, they had a lot of work to do. The first of it was taking care of the thousands of corpses littering the city. It was not a scene they wanted to encounter in the middle of the night after a hard day's march. She didn't look forward to returning to the site of that slaughter, but it was a place no one would expect to find them, and they could be safe there for a time. From that base, they could begin pulling the Midlands back together. She turned back to Captain Ryan. Is there anywhere near we can set up camp for the night? The captain gestured up the road. The scout said there's a small upland valley not far ahead. There's an abandoned farm there where Cyrilla will be comfortable for the night. She drew a strand of hair back from her face and hooked it behind an ear, noting that Cyrilla was no longer referred to as queen. Kaylin was queen now, and Prince Harold had made sure all knew it. All right, send word ahead then. Get the valley secured and set up camp. Post sentries and scout the area. If the surrounding slopes are deserted and the valley is cut off from view, then let the men have fires, but keep them small. Captain Ryan smiled and tapped a fist to his heart in salute. Fires would be a luxury, and hot food would do the men good. They deserved it after the hard march. They were almost home. Tomorrow they would be there. Then the worst of the work would begin. Taking care of the dead and putting Ebenissia back to order. Kalin would not let the Imperial Order's victory over Ebenissia stand. The Midlands would have the city back, and it would live again to strike back. Did you take care of Stevens? She asked the captain. Zed helped us find a place, and the men are taking care of it. Poor Stevens. He fought all through the battles against the Order when we started with 5,000, saw four of every five of his companions killed, and he ends up dying in an accident after it's over. I know he would have wanted to die defending the Midlands. He did, Kalin said. It's not over. We won only a battle, though an important one. We are still at war with the Imperial Order, and he was a soldier in that war. He was helping with our effort and died in the line of duty, just as much as those men killed in combat. There is no difference. He died a hero of the Midlands. Captain Ryan stuffed his hands in the pockets of his heavy brown wool coat. I think the men would appreciate hearing those words and would find courage in them. Before we move on, could you say something over his grave? It would mean a lot for the men to know their queen will miss him. Kalin smiled. Of course, Captain. It would be my honor. Kalin stared after the captain as he moved off to see to things. I shouldn't have been pushing on after dark. Zed stroked a reassuring hand along the back of her head. Accidents can happen in broad daylight. This very likely would have happened in the morning had we stopped sooner, and then it would be blamed on being still half asleep. I still feel to blame. It just doesn't seem fair. His smile marked no humor. Fate does not seek our consent. Chapter 33 If there were any bodies at the farm, the men had removed them by the time Kalin reached it. They had started a fire in the roughly built hearth, but it hadn't had time to thaw the iron chill from the deserted home. Cyrilla was carefully carried to the remains of a straw mattress in a back bedroom. There was another cramped room with two pallets, probably for children, and the main room with a table and little else. By the broken bits of a cupboard and chest and the remains of personal items, Kayla knew the order had been through here on their way to Ebenissia. She wondered again what the men had done with the bodies. She didn't want to find them in the night if she had to go outside to relieve herself. Zed peered around at the room as he rubbed his hands on his stomach. How long until dinner is ready? He asked in a cheery tone. He wore heavy maroon robes with black sleeves and cowled shoulders. Three rows of silver brocade circled the cuffs of his sleeves. Thicker gold brocade ran around the neck and down the front. The outfit gathered at the waist with a red satin belt set with a gold buckle. Zed hated the flashy accoutrements that Addie had insisted he purchase as a disguise. He preferred his simple robes, but they were long gone, as was his fancy hat with the long feather that he had lost somewhere along the way. 
Kaylin grinned in spite of herself. I don't know. What are you cooking? Me? Cook? Well, I suppose. Dear spirits, spare us that man's cooking, Eddie said from the doorway. We would be better served to eat bark and bugs. Eddie limped into the room, followed by Jebra, the seer, and Ahern, the coach driver, who had carried Zed and Eddie on their recent journeys. Chandelin, who had accompanied Kalin from the Mud People's village months ago, had departed after Kalin had been with Richard one wondrous night in a place between worlds. He wanted to return to his home and people. She couldn't blame him. She knew what it was to miss friends and loved ones. With Zed and Addie, she felt as if they were almost all together. When Richard caught up with them, then truly they would all be together again. Though it would probably be weeks yet, Kaylin still couldn't help being excited by each breath, because each breath brought her one moment closer to having her arms around him. My bones do be too old for this weather, Addie said as she crossed the room. Kaylin retrieved a simple wooden chair and dragged it along as she took Addie's arm and walked her to the fire. She put the chair close to the flames and urged the sorceress to sit and warm herself. Unlike Zed's original clothes, Addie's simple flaxen robes with yellow and red beads sewn at the neck in ancient symbols of her profession had survived their journey. Zed scowled every time he saw them, thinking it more than a little odd that her simple robes had managed to make the journey and his had been lost. Addie always smiled and said it was a wonder and insisted that he looked grand in his fine clothes. Kalin suspected she really did like him better in his new outfit. Kalin, too, thought Zed looked grand, though not so wizard-like as his traditional fashion made him look. Wizards of his high rank wore the simplest robes. There was no rank above Zed. First wizard. Thank you, child, Addie said as she warmed her hands near the flames. Orsk, Kalin called. The big man scurried forward. The scar over his missing eye was white in the firelight. Yes, mistress. He stood ready to carry out her instructions. What they might be was of no importance to him, his only concern being that he had a chance to please her. There's no pot in here. Could you get us one so we can make some dinner? His dark leather uniform creaked as he bowed and turned to hurry from the room. Orsk had been a Daharan soldier from the Imperial Order's camp. He had tried to kill her, and in the struggle she had touched him with her power, the magic of the confessors destroying forever who he had been and filling him with blind loyalty to her. That blind loyalty and devotion was a wearing presence to Kalin, a constant reminder of what and who she was. She tried not to see the man he had been, a Daharan soldier who had joined with the Imperial Order, one of the killers who had participated in the slaughter of the helpless women and children of Ebenissia. As the Mother Confessor, she had sworn no mercy on any of the men of the Order, and there had been none. Only Orsk still lived. Though he lived, the man who had fought for the Order was dead. Because of the death spell Zed had cast over her to aid in their escape from Aidendril, few knew Kaelin as the Mother Confessor. Orsk only knew her as his mistress. Zed, of course. Addie, Jebra, Ahern, Chandelen, her half-brother, Prince Harold, and Captain Ryan knew her true identity, but everyone else thought the Mother Confessor was dead. The men she had fought with knew her only as their queen. Their memory of her being the Mother Confessor had been confused and muddled into remembering her as Queen Kaelin, no less their leader, but not the Mother Confessor. After snow had been melted, Jebra and Kaelin added beans and bacon, cut up a few sweet roots to toss into the pot, and spooned in some molasses. Zed stood rubbing his hands as he watched the ingredients being added. Kalin grinned at his childlike eagerness and, from a pack, retrieved some hard bread for him. He was pleased and ate the bread while the beans boiled. While dinner cooked, Kalin thawed leftover soup they had brought in a small pot and took it in to Cirilla. She set a candle on a slat she stuck in a crack in the wall and sat on the edge of the bed in a quiet room. She wiped a warm cloth on her half-sister's forehead for a while and was happy to see Cyrilla's eyes open. A panicked gaze darted around the dim room. Kaelin grabbed Cyrilla's jaw and forced her to look up into her eyes. It's me, Kaelin, my sister. You are safe, alone with me. You are safe, be at ease. Everything is all right. Kaelin? Cyrilla clutched at Kaelin's white fur mantle. You promised. You won't go back on your word. You mustn't. Kaelin smiled. I promised. And I will keep the promise. 
I am the queen of Galia, and will be the queen until the day you wish the crown back. Cyrilla sagged back in relief, still clutching the fur mantle. Thank you, my queen. Kaelin urged her to sit up. Come on now, I've brought you some warm soup. Cyrilla turned her face from the spoon. I'm not hungry. If you want me to be the queen, then you must treat me as queen. A questioning frown came to Cyrilla's face. Kaelin smiled. This is an order from your queen. You will eat the soup. Only then would Cyrilla eat. When she had finished it all and had started shaking and crying again, Kaelin hugged her tight until she slipped into a trance-like state, staring blindly up at nothing. Kaelin tucked the heavy blankets tight around her and kissed her forehead. Zed had scrounged up a couple of barrels, a bench, a stool from the barn, and somewhere found another chair. He had asked Prince Harold and Captain Ryan to join Addy, Jebra, Ahern, Orsk, Kaelin, and himself for dinner. They were close to Ebenissia and had to talk about their plans. Everyone crowded around the small table as Kaelin broke up hard bread, and Jebra dished out steaming bowls of beans from the pot sitting in the fire. When the seer was finished, she sat down on the short bench beside Kaelin, all the while giving Zed puzzled looks. Prince Harold, a barrel-chested man with a head of long, thick, dark hair, reminded Kaelin of her father. Harold had only that day returned with his scouts from Ebenissia. What news have you from your home? she asked him. He broke his bread with his thick fingers. Well, he sighed, it was the same as you described it. It doesn't look as if anyone else has been there. I think it'll be safe enough for us there. With the Order's army destroyed... The one in this area, Kalin corrected. He conceded the point with a wave of his bread. I don't think we'll have any trouble for now. We don't have many men yet, but they're good men. And we have enough to protect the city from up in the passes and the mountains all around, as long as they don't come in numbers like before. Until the Order brings more men, I think we can hold the city. He gestured toward Zed. And we have a wizard. Zed, busy spooning beans into his mouth, only slowed enough to grunt in agreement. Captain Ryan swallowed a big mouthful of beans. Prince Harold is right. We know these mountains. We can defend the city until they bring a large force. By then, maybe we'll have more men joining with us and we can start to move. Harold dunked his bread in his bowl, scooping up a chunk of bacon. Addy, what do you judge our chances of getting help from Nicobarese? My homeland be in turmoil. When Zed and I were there, we learned that the king be dead. The blood of the fold has moved to seize power, but not all the people be pleased about it. The sorceresses be most displeased. If the blood takes power, those women will be hunted down and killed. I expect them to back the forces in the army who resist the blood. With civil war, Zed said, interrupting his speedy spoonwork, it doesn't bode well for sending troops to aid the Midlands, Addie sighed. Zed be right. Maybe some of the sorceresses could help, Kaelin asked. Addie stirred her spoon in her beans. Maybe. Kaelin looked to her half-brother. But you have troops from other areas you can call in? Harold nodded. We sure do. At least sixty or seventy thousand, perhaps as many as a hundred thousand could be marshaled, though not all of those will be well-trained or well-armed. It'll take time to get them organized, but when we do, then Ebenissia will be a force to be reckoned with. We had nearly that many here before, Captain Ryan reminded them without looking up from his bowl. And it wasn't enough. True, Harold said, flourishing his bread. But that's just for a beginning. He looked to Kaelin. You can bring more of the lands together, can't you? That's our hope, she said. We must rally the Midlands around us, if we're to have a chance. What about Sandaria? Captain Ryan asked. Their lances are the best in the Midlands. And Liffany, Harold said. They make a lot of weapons and know how to use them. Kaelin picked a soft pinch out of the center of her bread. Sandaria relies on Kelton for summer grazing for their sheep herds. Liffany buys iron from Kelton and sells them grain. Herjaborg relies on Sandaria's wool. I think they all might go where Kelton goes. Harold stabbed his spoon into his beans. There were Keltish dead among the ones who attacked Ebenissia. And Galeans. Kaelin put the bread in her mouth and chewed for a moment as she watched him clench his spoon as if it were a knife. He glared into his bowl. There were insurgents and murderers from many lands who joined them, she said after she had swallowed. That does not mean their homelands will. Prince Fyron of Kelton had committed his land to the Imperial Order, but he's dead now. We are not at war with Kelton. 
They are part of the Midlands. We are at war with the Imperial Order. We need to stand together. If Kelton joins with us, the others will almost have to. But if they go with the Order, then we will have trouble convincing the others to join us. We need to win over Kelton and bond them to us. Well, I bet on Kelton joining with the Order, Ahern said. Everyone turned his way. He shrugged. I'm Keltish. I can tell you that they'll go where the crown goes. It's the way of our people. With Firen dead, then that would make Duchess Lumholtz next in line. She and her husband, the Duke, will go to the side they think will win, no matter who that may be. At least that's my opinion from what I've heard about her. That's foolish, Harold threw his spoon down. As much as I don't trust Keltons, no offense intended, Ahern, and know their scheming ways, at the heart of it, they're Midlanders. They may want to grab whatever scrap of a farm lies on a disputed border and call it Keltish, but the people are still Midlanders. The spirits know that Cyrilla and I had our fights, but when it came to trouble, we stood together. Same with our lands. When Dahara attacked last summer, we fought to protect Kelton, despite some of our disagreements. If it means the future of the Midlands, they'll go with us. The Midlands means more than what anyone come new to the crown has to say about it. Harold snatched up his spoon and waved it at Ahern. What do you have to say about that? Ahern shrugged. Nothing, I guess. Zed's eyes moved between the two men. We are not here to argue. We are here to fight a war. Speak what you believe, Ahern. You are Keltish and would know more of it than we. Ahern scratched his wind-burned face as he thought on Zed's words. General Baldwin, the commander of all Keltish forces, and his generals Bradford, Cutter, and Emerson will go where the crown goes. I don't know the men. I'm just the driver. But I go a lot of places and I hear a lot of talk. And that's what's always said of them. People have a joke that if the queen tossed her crown out the window and it caught on a buck's antlers, the whole of the army would be grazing on grass within a month. And from the talk you hear, do you really believe this duchess become queen will go with the order just for a chance at power? If it means breaking with the Midlands, Zed asked. Ahern shrugged. It's just my opinion, understand. But I think it would be so. As Kaelin spooned out a sweet root without looking up, she spoke. Ahern's right. I know Catherine Lumholtz and her husband, the Duke. She will be queen, and even though she takes counsel from her husband, she is of like mind anyway. Prince Firen would have been king, and I thought he would have stuck with us no matter what, but someone from the Order won him to their side, and he betrayed us. I'm sure the Order will make Catherine Lumholtz similar offers. She will see power in those offers. Harold reached across the table and snatched up some more bread. If she does, and Ahern's right, then we've lost Kelton. If we've lost Kelton, then we've got the first crack of ruin. This not be good, Addie observed. Nicobaris be in trouble. Galia be weakened when so many of her army be killed in Evanicia, and Kelton be leaning toward the Order. And with her will go a number of lands that betrayed partners. And then there are some of the others who, when enough, the quiet, clear ring of authority in Kaelin's voice lowered a pall of silence over the table. She remembered what Richard always said when they were in more trouble than they knew how to wiggle out of. Think of the solution, not the problem. If your mind was filled only with thoughts of why you were going to lose, then you couldn't think of how to win. Stop telling me why we can't bring the Midlands back together and why we can't win. We already know there are problems. We need to discuss the solutions. Zed smiled over his spoon. Well put, Mother Confessor. I think we must have some ideas. For one, there are a number of smaller lands that will remain loyal to the Midlands no matter what. We must gather their representatives in Ebenicia and begin rebuilding the council. That's right, Kalen said. They might not be as powerful as Kelton, but there is a quality to numbers that has influence. Kaelin opened her fur mantle. The crackling fire was warming the room a bit, and the food was warming her belly. But it was worry that was beginning to make her sweat. She couldn't wait for Richard to join them. He would have ideas. Richard never sat around letting events dictate as they would. She watched the others as they bent over their bowls, each with a frown as they pondered their options. Well, Addie said as she set her spoon down. I be sure we could get some sorceresses from the Cobarees to join with us. They would be a powerful aid. While some would refuse to fight, as it be against their convictions, they would not be averse to helping in other ways. 
None want to see the blood or their allies, the Imperial Order, take the Midlands. Most know the terror of times past and would not want them to come anew. Good, Kalin said. That's good. Do you think you could go there and convince them to join with us? Maybe get some of the regular army to help too? After all, the Civil War is part of the larger war, and it would not be going on if at least some didn't want to aid the Midlands. Addie's completely white eyes regarded Kalin for a moment. For something this important, of course I will try. Kalin nodded. Thank you, Addie. She looked to the others. What else? Any ideas? Harold rested an elbow on the table as he frowned in thought. He waggled his spoon. I think if I sent some officers as an official delegation to some of the smaller lands, they could be convinced to send representatives to Ebenicia. Most hold Galia in high regard and know how the Midlands has protected their freedom. They will come to our aid. And perhaps, Zed said with a sly smile, if I went to visit this Queen Lumholtz as first wizard, mind you, I could convince her that the Midlands is not without power of its own. Kaelin knew Catherine Lumholtz, but she didn't want to douse the warm hope of Zed's idea. She was the one, after all, who had said they needed to think of solutions instead of the problems. What held her in the grip of terror was the thought of being the mother confessor who lost the Midlands. When dinner was finished, Prince Harold and Captain Ryan went to see to the men. Ahern threw his long coat around his broad shoulders and said he had to check on his team. After they were gone, Zed caught Jebra's arm as she went about helping Kalen collect the bowls. Do you want to tell me now what it is you're seeing every time you look my way? Jebra turned her blue eyes from his gaze and gathered another spoon into her hand with the others. It's nothing. I would like to be the judge of that if you don't mind. She halted and at last looked up at him. Wings. Zed lifted an eyebrow. Wings? She nodded. I see you with wings. You see, it makes no sense. It has to be a vision that means nothing. I told you, I get those kinds sometimes. That's it, just wings. Jebra fussed with her short sandy hair. Well, you are up in the air with these wings, and you are dropped into a huge ball of flame. The fine wrinkles at the corners of her eyes deepened. Wizard Zorander, I don't know what it means. It's not an event. You know how my visions work sometimes, but a sense of events. I don't know what they mean, all jumbled together like that. Zed released her arm. Thank you, Jebra. If you learn anything else, you will tell me? She nodded. And at once. We need all the help we can get. Her eyes sought the floor as she nodded again. Her head tilted toward Kalin. Circles. I see the Mother Confessor running around in circles. Circles? Kalin asked as she stepped closer. Why am I running in circles? I can't tell. Well, I feel as if I'm running in circles right now, trying to find a way to pull the Midlands back together. Jebra looked up, hopefully. That may be it. Kalin offered her a smile. Maybe it is. Your visions aren't always of calamity. As they all started to go back to cleaning up, Jebra spoke again. Mother Confessor, we mustn't leave your sister alone with any ropes. What do you mean? Jebra let out a breath. She is dreaming of hanging herself. You mean that you have seen a vision of her hanging herself? Jebra laid a concerned hand to Kalin's arm. Oh no, Mother Confessor, I've not seen that. It's just that I can see the aura, see that she is dreaming of doing it. It does not mean she will, only that we must watch her, so she won't have the chance before she can recover. That sounds like sound advice, Zed offered. Jebra tied the leftover bread in a cloth. I will sleep with her tonight. Thank you, Kalin said. Why don't you let me finish cleaning up and you go to bed now in case she wakes? Zed, Addie, and Kalin shared the chores after Jebra took her bedroll into the room with Cirilla. When they were finished, Zed placed a chair before the fire for Addie. Kalin loosely twined her fingers together and stood looking into the flames. Zed, when we send the delegations to the smaller lands to ask them to come to a council in Ebenicia, it would be easier to convince them if it were an official delegation from the Mother Confessor. Zed finally broke the quiet. They all think the Mother Confessor is dead. If we let them know you're alive, then you become a target, and it would bring the order down on us before we could gather a strong enough force. Kalin turned and gripped his robes. Zed, I'm tired of being dead. 
He patted her hand on his arm. You're the Queen of Galia, and you can use your influence in that way for now. If the Imperial Order finds out you're alive, then we'll have more trouble than we're prepared to handle. If we're going to unite the Midlands, then they need a mother confessor. Kaelin, I know you don't want to do anything to jeopardize the lives of those men out there. They've just won a costly battle. They aren't strong enough yet. We need more gathered to our side. If anyone knows you are the Mother Confessor, then you become a target, and they will have to fight to protect you. If you must fight, it must be for the right reasons. We don't need more problems than we can handle right now. Kaylin pressed the tips of her fingers together as she stared into the fire. Zed, I am the Mother Confessor. I'm terrified I will be the Mother Confessor who presides over the destruction of the Midlands. I was born a Confessor. It's more than my job. It is who I am. Zed hugged her shoulders. Dear one, you are still the Mother Confessor. That's why we must hide your identity for now. We need the Mother Confessor. When the time comes, you will rule over the Midlands again. A Midlands stronger than it has ever been. Have patience. Patience, she muttered. Ah, oh, well, he said with a grin. There is magic in patience, too, you know. Zed be right, Addie said from her chair. The wolf does not survive if he announces to the herd he be a wolf. He makes his plans of attack, and only at the last moment lets the prey know that it be he, the wolf, who be after them. Kaelin rubbed her arms. There was more to it. Another reason. Zed, she whispered with the pain of it. I can't stand this spell any longer. It's driving me mad. I can feel it all the time, like death walking in my flesh with me. Zed pulled her head to his shoulder. My daughter used to say the same thing. Those very words, in fact. Like death walking in my flesh with me. How did she stand it all those years? Zed sighed. Well, when Dark and Rahl raped her, I knew that if he thought she was alive, he would come after her. There was no choice. I wanted to protect her more than I wanted to go after him. I took her to the Midlands, where Richard was born, and then she had another reason to hide. If Dark and Rahl ever knew, he might have come after Richard, too, so she had to endure it. Kaelin shuddered. All those years? I wouldn't have the strength. How could she stand it? Well, there was no alternative for one thing, and for another. She said that after a time, she became used to it a bit, and it wasn't so bad as it was in the beginning. The feeling will ease a bit over time. You will get used to it, and hopefully you will not have to go on long like this. I hope so, Kaelin said, the firelight flickering on Zed's thin face. She also said that having Richard lessened the burden. Kaelin's heart leapt at the mere mention aloud of his name. She grinned. That will surely help. She clutched Zed's arm. He'll be here soon. He won't let anything hold him back. He'll be here in a couple of weeks at the most. Dear spirits, how will I ever wait that long? Zed chuckled. You have as little patience as that boy. You two were made for each other. He brushed back her hair. Your eyes look better already, dear one. Then, when Richard is with us, and we start pulling the Midlands back together, you can take this death spell off me. Then the Midlands will have a mother confessor again. It can't be soon enough for me, either, Kaelin frowned. Zed, if you go away to see Queen Catherine, and I need to get this spell off, how can I do it? Zed looked back to the flames. You can't. If you were to announce that you were the mother confessor, People would believe you no more than if Jebra were to announce that she was the Mother Confessor. The spell won't leave because you simply declare who you are. Then how do I get it off? Zed sighed. Only I can do that. Kaelin felt a sudden flush of fear. She didn't want to voice it, but she would be trapped with the spell if anything happened to Zed. But surely there must be another way to remove the spell. Perhaps Richard? Zed shook his head. Even if Richard knew how to be a wizard, he could not remove the web. Only I can do it. And that's the only way? Yes. He looked back to her eyes. Unless, of course, another with the gift were to deduce your true identity. 
If such a man were to see you, understand who you were, and name you aloud, then it would break the spell, and all would once again know your identity. There was no hope of that. She felt her hopes sink. Kaelin squatted and shoved another stick of wood in the fire. The only way she was going to get the death spell off was for Zed to do it, and he wasn't going to do it until he was good and ready. As Mother Confessor, she would not order a wizard to do something both knew was wrong. Kaelin watched the sparks swirling up. She brightened. Richard would be with her soon, and it wouldn't be so bad then. When Richard was with her, she wouldn't think about the spell. She would be too busy kissing him. What's funny? Zed asked. What? Oh, nothing. She stood and brushed her hands off on her pants. I think I'll go check on the men. Maybe some cold air will get this spell off my mind. The cold air did feel good. She stood in the clearing outside the small farmhouse and took a deep breath. The wood smoke smelled good. She recalled the previous days when they were on the march, and her feet and fingers felt frozen when her ears burned with the bite of cold and her nose ran, how she daydreamed about wood smoke because it meant the warmth of a fire. Kaylin strolled across the field outside the house. She stared up at the stars, her breath drifting slowly in the still air. She could see small fires dotting the valley beyond, and she could hear the murmurs of conversation of the men sitting around the fires. She was glad they, too, could have fires this night. Soon they would be at Ebenissia, and they could be warm again. Kaylin took a deep breath of the cold air, trying to forget the spell. The whole sky was a glitter with stars, like sparks from a huge fire. She wondered what Richard was doing right now, and if he was riding hard or getting sleep. She longed to see him, but she also wanted him to get enough sleep. When he finally reached her, she could sleep in his arms. She grinned at the thought. Kaylin frowned as a swath of stars went dark. Almost as soon as they darkened, they winked back to points of light. Had she really seen them go dark for an instant? Must be her imagination, she thought. She heard a thud as something hit the ground. No alarm went up. Only one thing could get through the ring of defenders and not raise an alarm. She tingled in sudden goose flesh, and it wasn't the spell. Kaelin yanked her knife free. Chapter 34 She saw glowing green eyes. In the faint light coming from the small winter moon and the stars, she saw a great hulk step toward her. Kaelin wanted to cry out, but her voice wasn't there. When the huge beast's lips drew back, she saw the entire length of its prodigious fangs. She staggered back a step. She was squeezing the knife handle so hard that her fingers ached. If she was quick, and if she didn't panic, she might have a chance. If she called out, would Zed hear her? Would anyone hear her? Even if they did, they were too far away. They wouldn't be able to get to her in time. In the dim light, she could see by its size that it was a short-tailed gar. It would have to be a short-tailed gar. They were the smartest, the biggest, the most deadly. Dear spirits, why couldn't it be a long-tailed gar? Kaelin stared as it lifted something from its chest. Why was it just standing there? Where were its blood flies? It looked down, looked up at her, and looked down again. The eyes glowed a menacing green. Its lips drew back farther, vapor clouding the air when it let out a gurgling sound. Kaelin's eyes went wide. Could it be? Gratch? The gar suddenly started jumping up and down, howling with excitement and flapping its wings. Kaelin sagged with heady relief. She sheathed her knife and stepped closer to the towering beast, but she was still cautious. Gratch? Is that you, Gratch? The gar vigorously nodded his huge, grotesque head. Gratch! He called out in a deep growl that resonated in her breastbone. He thumped his chest with both claws. Gratch! Gratch, did Richard send you? The gar's wings flapped more energetically at the mention of Richard's name. She came closer. Did Richard send you? Gratch, lug, rich, arg. Kalen blinked. Richard had told her that Gratch tried to talk. She suddenly giggled. Kalen loves Richard, too. She tapped her chest. I'm Kalen, Gratch. I'm so happy to meet you. She gasped as the gar lunged forward and scooped her up in his furry arms, lifting her feet clear of the ground. Her first thought was that he was surely going to crush her, but he was surprisingly gentle as he held her to his smooth chest. 
Kaylin reached around the great body and hugged the gar's sides. She couldn't get her arms even halfway around him. Kaylin could never have imagined doing such a thing, but now she was brought nearly to tears because Gratch was Richard's friend and Richard had sent the gar to her. It was almost as if it were a hug sent from Richard himself. The gar carefully set her on the ground. He studied her with his glowing green eyes. She stroked a hand along the fur at the side of his chest as the hulking creature reached down and tenderly stroked her hair with a huge, deadly claw. Kalin grinned up at the wrinkled face full of fangs. Gratch let out a purling gurgle. His wings moved in slow, contented sweeps as she stroked his fur, and he stroked her hair. You're safe here with us, Gratch. Richard told me all about you. I don't know how much you can understand, but you're among friends. When his lips drew back, again exposing the full length of his fangs, she suddenly realized it was a smile. It was the ugliest smile she had ever seen, but it had an innocent quality to it that made her grin, too. She had never in her life thought that Gars could smile. It truly was a marvel. Gratch, did Richard send you? Gratch, arg! Gratch thumped his chest. He flapped his wings hard enough that it briefly lifted his feet from the ground. Then he reached out and tapped Kalin's shoulder. Kalin's mouth fell open. The gar was telling her something, and she understood. Richard sent you to find me? Gratch went wild with glee that she understood. He scooped her up in his arms again. She laughed at the whole marvelous nature of it all. When he set her down again, she asked, Was it hard to find me? He let out a whine and shrugged. It was a little bit hard? Gratch nodded. Kayla knew a wide variety of languages, but she couldn't help laughing again at the very idea of communicating with a gar. She shook her head in wonder. Who but Richard would think to befriend a gar? Kaylin took a claw up in her hand. Come on in the house. There is someone I want you to meet. Gratch gurgled his assent. Kaylin paused in the doorway. Zed and Addie looked up from their chairs beside the fire. I'd like to introduce a friend, she said, as she pulled Gratch in behind her by a claw. He ducked under the doorframe, folding his wings to fit through and then once inside straightened to nearly his full height behind her, still stooping a bit to fit under the ceiling. Zed toppled backward in his chair, his skinny arms and legs flailing at the air. Zed, stop it, you're going to frighten him, she scolded. Frighten him, Zed croaked. You told me that Richard said it was a baby gar. That thing is nearly full grown. Gratch's massive eyebrows drew together in a frown as he watched the wizard scramble to his feet and tug at his tangled robes. Kaylin held a hand out. Gratch, this is Richard's grandfather, Zed. The leathery lips drew back, showing the fangs again. Gratch held his claws out and started across the room. Zed flinched and stumbled back. Why is he doing that? Has he had dinner? Kaylin laughed so hard she could hardly get the words out. He's smiling. He likes you. He wants a hug. A hug? Most certainly not. It was too late. With only three strides, the gar had closed the distance in the small room and was already scooping up the bony wizard in his huge, furry arms. Zed let out a muffled cry. Gratch gurgled a giggle as he lifted Zed from his feet. Bags! Zed tried unsuccessfully to back away from the gar's breath. This flying rug has eaten, and you don't want to know what! Gratch finally set Zed down. The wizard scrambled back a few steps and shook his finger at the beast. Now look here, we'll have no more of that. You just keep your arms to yourself. Gratch wilted, again letting out a purling whine. Zed, Kalin admonished, you've hurt his feelings. He's Richard's friend and ours too, and he's had a difficult time finding us. The least you can do is be nice to him. Zed harumphed. Well, perhaps you're right, he peered up at the hopeful beast. I'm sorry, Gratch. On occasion, I suppose it would be all right for you to hug me. Before the wizard could lift his arms to try to hold the gar back, Gratch had again scooped him up and was hugging him like a rag doll, Zed's feet swinging to and fro. Gratch at last set the gasping wizard to the floor. Addie held out a hand to shake. I be Addie, Gratch. I be pleased to meet you. Gratch ignored the hand and threw his furry arms around her, too. Kaylin had often seen Addie smile, but she rarely let out her raspy laugh. She was laughing now. Gratch laughed with her in his own rumbling way. 
When order was restored to the room and everyone had caught their breath, Kalin saw Jebra's wide eyes peeking out from a slit in the bedroom door. It's all right, Jebra. It's Gratch, a friend of ours. Kalin clamped a restraining grip to the fur of Gratch's arm. You can hug her later. Gratch shrugged with a nod. Kalin turned him toward her and took up one of his claws in both of her hands. She looked up into his glowing green eyes. Gratch, did Richard send you on ahead to tell us he will be here soon? Gratch shook his head. Kalin swallowed. But he's on his way? He's left Aiden Drill and he's on his way to catch up with us? Gratch studied her face. His claw came up and stroked her hair. Kalin saw that he had a lock of her hair on a leather thong at his throat, along with the dragon's tooth. He slowly shook his head again. Kalin's heart sank like a rock in a well. He's not on his way, but he sent you to me? Gratch nodded, adding a small flap of his wings. Why? Do you know why? Gratch nodded. He reached over his shoulder and caught hold of something hanging on his back by another thong. He pulled a long red object over his shoulder and held it out to her at the end of the thong. What is it? Zed asked. Kalin started working the knot free. It's a document case. Maybe it's a letter from Richard. Gratch nodded at the guess. When she had freed the knot, she asked Gratch to sit down. He squatted contentedly to the side as Kalin drew the rolled and flattened letter from the pouch. Zed sat beside Addie next to the fire. Let's hear the boy's excuses, and they had better be good ones, or he is in a lot of trouble. I agree with you about that, she said under her breath. There's enough wax on this thing for two dozen letters. We need to teach Richard how to seal a document. She turned it in the light. It's the sword. He's pressed the hilt of the sword of truth into the wax. So we will know it's truly from him, Zed observed as he fed a piece of wood into the fire. When she had finished breaking all the wax, Kaylin unfurled the letter and turned her back to the fire so she could read it. My dearest queen, she read aloud, I pray to the good spirits that this letter reaches your hands. Zed shot to his feet. That's a message! Kaylin frowned at him. Well, of course it is. It's his letter. He waved his thin hand. No, no, I mean he's telling us something. I know Richard. I know the way he thinks. He's telling us he fears that if someone were to get their hands on this letter, it might betray us or him. So he's warning us that he can't say everything he might like to. Kaylin pulled her lower lip through her teeth. Yes, that would make sense. Richard usually thinks things through. Zed gestured as he turned to make sure his bony bottom would hit the chair as he sat. Go on. My dearest queen, I pray to the good spirits that this letter reaches your hands and it finds you and your friends well and safe. Much has happened, and I must beg your understanding. The alliance of the Midlands is ended. Overhead, Magda Cirrus, the first mother confessor, and her wizard Merit glare down upon me because they have witnessed its end, and because it is I who have ended it. Realize that I know full well the weight of thousands of years of history staring down upon me from overhead, but please try to understand that if I had not acted, then our only future would be as slaves to the Imperial Order, and then that history would be forgotten. Kaylin put a hand to her chest over her thumping heart and paused to gulp air before she went on. Months ago, the Imperial Order began the undoing of the Alliance, winning converts to their side and unraveling the unity that was the Midlands. As we fought the Keeper, they fought to steal the security of our home. Perhaps there would have been a chance to bring unity once more, had we the luxury of time but the Order presses their plans and denies us that luxury. With the Mother Confessor dead, I was forced to do what must be done to forge unity. What? What has he done? Zed croaked. Kalin shot him a silencing glare over the top of the trembling letter, and then went on. Delay is weakness, and weakness is death at the hands of the Order. Our beloved Mother Confessor knew the cost of failure and has charged us with carrying this war to victory. She has declared this a war without mercy on the Imperial Order. Her wisdom in this was infallible. The Alliance, however, was fragmented with self-interest. This was a prelude to ruin. I was forced to act. My troops have captured Aidendril. Page 294. Zed exploded. Bags and double bags! What's he talking about? He has no troops! He just has his sword and this flying rug with fangs! Gratch rose with a growl. Zed flinched. Kalin blinked away the tears. Be quiet, both of you. 
Zed glanced from her to the gar. Sorry, Gratch, no offense intended. They both sank back down as she went on. Today, I gathered the representatives of the lands here in Aidendrill and informed them that the Alliance of the Midlands is dissolved. My troops have surrounded their palaces and will shortly have disarmed their soldiers. I told them, as I will tell you, that there are only two sides in this war, our side and the Imperial Order. There will be no bystanders. We will have unity one way or another. All lands of the Midlands must surrender to Dahara. Dahara? Bags! Kaelin didn't look up as tears dripped from her face. If I have to tell you again to be quiet, you will wait outside while I read this letter. Addie took a fistful of Zed's robes and pulled him down into his chair. Read on. Kaelin cleared her throat. I explained to the representatives that you, the Queen of Galia, were to marry me. And through your surrender and our union, it shows that this is a union forged in peace with common goals and mutual respect, and not a matter of conquest. Lands will be allowed to retain their heritage and lawful traditions, but not their sovereignty. Magic in all forms will be protected. We will be one people, with one army, under one command, and under one law. All lands that join us through their surrender will have a say in formulating those laws. Kalin's voice broke. I must ask you to return at once to Aidendrill and surrender Galia. I must deal with matters of various lands, and your knowledge and assistance would be invaluable. I informed the representatives that surrender is mandatory. There will be no favoritism. Any who fail to surrender will be put under siege. They will not be allowed to trade with us until they surrender. If they do not surrender willingly, with all the benefits that that entails, and we are compelled to gain their surrender by force of arms, then they will not only forfeit those benefits, but incur sanctions as well. As I said, there will be no bystanders. We will be one. My queen, I would give my life for you, and I want nothing more than to be your husband. But if my actions turn your heart against me, I would not force your hand in marriage. Understand, though, that the surrender of your land is necessary and vital. We must live by one law. I cannot afford to show special favors to any land, or we are lost before we begin. Kaelin had to pause to gasp back a sob. She could hardly read the watery words wavering before her eyes. Mriswith have attacked the city. A low whistle came from between Zed's teeth. She ignored it and read on. With Gratch's help, I have put their remains on pikes to decorate the front lawn of the Confessor's palace so all may see the fate of our enemies. Mriswith can be invisible at will. Besides myself, only Gratch can detect them when they are shrouded by their cloaks. I fear they will come for you so I have sent Gratch for protection. We must remember one thing above all others. The Order wishes to destroy magic. They are not shy about using it, though. It is our magic they wish to destroy. Please tell my grandfather that he, too, must return at once. His ancestral home is in danger. This is why I had to take Aidendril and cannot leave. I fear to let the enemy have my grandfather's ancestral home and the dire consequences that would ensue. Zed couldn't keep silent. Bags, he whispered to himself as he came to his feet again. Richard's talking about the wizard's keep. He didn't want to write it, but that's what he's referring to. How can I be so stupid? The boy is right. We can't let them have the keep. There are things of powerful magic in there that the Order would dearly pay to put their hands on. Richard doesn't know about the magic in there, but he's smart enough to understand the danger. I've been a blind fool. With a cold fright, Kalin realized the truth of it, too. If the Order were to take the keep, they would have access to enormously powerful magic. Zed, Richard is there all alone. He knows almost nothing about magic. He doesn't know anything about the kind of people in Aidendril who can use magic. He's a fawn in a bear's den. Dear spirits, he has no idea of the danger he's in. Zed nodded grimly. The boy's in over his head. Addie let out a mocking laugh. In over his head? He has stolen aid and drill and access to the keep right from under the nose of the Order. They have sent Mriswith against him, and he puts them on pikes outside the palace. He probably has the lands on the verge of surrender into a union that can fight the Order, the very thing we were trying to think how to accomplish. He be using the very thing that be our problem, trade, and uses even that as a weapon to force their hand. He not be waiting to try to reason with them. 
He has simply put a knife to their throats. If they start falling to him, he could very well soon have the whole of the Midlands in his fist. The important lands, anyway. And with them all joined with Dahara, as one force, one command, Zed said. It could be a force that could stand against the Order. He turned to Kaelin. Is there any more? She nodded. A bit. Though I fear greatly from my heart, I fear, too, the results should I fail to act, for the shadow of tyranny that will forever darken the world. If we don't do this, then Ebenezer's fate will have been only the beginning. I will put my faith in your love, though I can't help fearing this test of it. Though I am surrounded by bodyguards, and one has already laid down her life for me, their presence is not what I need to feel secure. You all must return to Aidendril at once. Do not delay. Gratch will keep you safe from the Mriswith until you are with me. Signed, yours in this world and those beyond, Richard Rahl, Master of Dahara. Zed whistled through his teeth again. Master of Dahara? What has that boy done? Kaelin lowered the letter in her trembling hands. He has destroyed me. That is what he has done. Addie lifted a thin finger in her direction. Now you listen to me, Mother Confessor. Richard knows very well what he be doing to you, and has laid his heart open to you for it. He told you that he writes that letter under the image of Magda Cirrus because he be pained by what he must do, and understands what it means to you. He would rather lose your heart than let you be killed by what will come if he bows to the past instead of minding the future. He has done what we could not do. We would be begging for unity. He has demanded it and put teeth to the demand. If you wish to truly be the Mother Confessor and put the safety of your people above all else, then you will help Richard. Zed lifted an eyebrow, but remained silent. At the name, Gratch spoke up. Gratch, lug, rich, arg. Kaelin wiped a tear from her cheek and sniffed. I love Richard, too. Kaelin, Zed said reassuringly, just as the spell will be removed from you in time, I'm sure that you will once again be the Mother Confessor. You don't understand, she said, holding back the tears. For thousands of years, a Mother Confessor has always protected the Midlands through the Alliance. I will be the Mother Confessor who failed the Midlands. Zed shook his head. No, you will be the Mother Confessor who had the strength to save the people of the Midlands. She put a hand to her heart. I'm not so sure. Zed stepped closer. Kalen. Richard is the seeker of truth. He carries the sword of truth. I am the one who named him. As first wizard, I recognized him as the one with the instincts of the seeker. He is acting on those instincts. Richard is a rare person. He reacts as the seeker and with the use of the gift. He is doing what he thinks he must. We must put our faith in him, even if we don't fully understand why he is doing what he is doing. Bags, he may not even fully understand why he's doing what he is doing. Read the letter again to yourself, Addie said. Listen to his words with your heart, and you will feel his heart in them. And remember, too, that there may be things he didn't dare to put on the paper in case it be captured. Kaylin wiped the back of her hand across her nose. I know it sounds selfish, but that's not it. I am the Mother Confessor. A trust has been passed down to me from all those who have gone before me. When I was chosen, that trust was put into my hands. It became my responsibility. When I ascended to Mother Confessor, I swore oaths. With a bony finger, Zed lifted her chin. An oath to protect your people. There is no sacrifice too great for that. Maybe so. I will think on it. Besides her tears, Kaelin fought to keep down the hackles of anger. I love Richard, but I would never do something like this to him. I just don't think he understands what he is doing to me, to the mother confessors before me who have given their lives. I think he does, Addie said in a soft rasp. Zed's face suddenly went nearly as white as his hair. Bags, he whispered. You don't think Richard would be foolish enough to go into the keep, do you? Kalen's head came up. There are spells to protect the keep. Richard doesn't know how to use his magic. He won't know how to get past them. Zed leaned closer to her. You said he has subtractive magic. 
in addition to his additive. The spells are additive. If Richard has any use of his subtractive, he will be able to walk right through even the most powerful of the spells I put on the keep, Kalin gasped. He told me that at the Palace of the Prophets, he was able to simply walk through all the shields because they were additive. The only one that stopped him was the perimeter shield, and that was because it had subtractive too. If that boy goes into the keep, there are things in there that could kill him in a heartbeat. That's why we put shields there, so no one can get near them. Bags, there are shields that even I have not dared pass through. For someone that doesn't know what he's doing, that place is a death trap. Zed grabbed her by the shoulders. Kaelin, do you think he would go into the keep? I don't know, Zed. You practically raised him. You would know better than I. He wouldn't go in there. He knows how dangerous magic can be. He's a smart boy. Unless he wants something. He peered at her with one eye. Want something? What do you mean? Kaelin wiped the last of the tears from her cheek. Well, when we were with the mud people, he wanted a gathering. The birdman warned him that it would be dangerous. An owl brought a spirit message. It hit him right in the head, cut his scalp, and then dropped to the ground dead. The birdman said it was a dire warning from the spirits of the danger to Richard. Richard called the gathering anyway. That was when Dark and Rahl came back from the underworld. If Richard wants something, nothing will stop him. Zed winced. But he doesn't want anything right now. He has no need to go in there. Zed, you know Richard. He likes to learn things. He may decide to just go have a peek out of curiosity. A peek can be just as deadly. He said in the letter that one of his guards was killed. Kalin frowned. In fact, he said she. Why would his guard be a woman? Zed flailed his arms impatiently. I don't know. What were you going to say about the guard being killed? For all we know, it could be that someone from the Order is already in the keep and killed her by using magic from the keep. Or it could be that he fears the Mris with want to take the keep, and he will go there to try to protect it. Zed ran a thumb down his smooth jaw. He has no idea of the dangers in Aiden Drill. But worse, he has no inkling of the deadly nature of the things in the keep. I remember telling him one time that objects of magic like the Sword of Truth and books were kept there. I never thought to say many were dangerous. Kalin clutched his arm. Books? You told him that there were books there? Zed grunted. Big mistake. Kalin let out a sigh. I should say so. Zed threw his arms up. We have to get to Aiden Drill at once. He gripped Kalin by her shoulders. Richard doesn't have control of his gift. If the Order uses magic to take the keep, Richard won't be able to stop them. We could lose this war before we have a chance to fight back. Kalin's fists tightened. I can't believe it. We've spent weeks running from Aiden Drill, and now we have to run back there? It will take weeks more. The sun has already set on the days we made those choices. We must concentrate on what we can do tomorrow. We can't relive yesterday. Kalin eyed Gratch. Richard sent us a letter. We can send him one back and warn him. That won't help him hold the keep should they use magic. Kalin's head was spinning with fragments of thoughts and hurried solutions. Gratch, could you carry one of us back to Richard? Gratch eyed each of them, his gaze lingering on the wizard. At last, he shook his head. Kaylin chewed her lower lip in frustration. Zed paced back and forth before the fire, muttering to himself. Addie stared off in thought. Kaylin suddenly gasped. Zed, could you use magic? Zed halted his pacing and looked up. What sort of magic? Like you did with the wagon today, lifting it with magic. I can't fly, dear one, just lift things. But could you make us lighter, like the wagon, so that Gratch could then carry us? Zed twisted up his wrinkled face. No, it would be too hard to maintain the effort. It works on spiritless things, like rocks or wagons, but it's altogether another matter to do it to living things. I could lift us all up for a bit, but only for a few minutes. Could you do it for just yourself? Could you make yourself light enough so that Gratch could carry you? Zed brightened. Yes, perhaps. It would take a great effort to maintain it for that much time, but I think I might be able to do it. Could you do it too, Addie? Addie sagged in her chair. No, I do not have the power he does. I could not do it. Kaylin swallowed back her apprehension. Then you have to go, Zed. 
You can get to Aden Drill weeks before we could travel there. Richard needs you right now. We can't wait. Every minute's delay is a danger to our side. Zed threw his skinny arms up. I can't leave you defenseless. I have Addy. What if the Mariswith come, as Richard is worried about? Then you wouldn't have Gratch. Addy can't help with the Mariswith. Kalin clutched his black sleeve. If Richard goes in the keep, he could be killed. If the Order gets the wizard's keep and the magic in it, then we are all dead. This is more important than my life. This is about what happened to everyone in Ebenissia. If we let them win, then a great many will die and the living will be condemned to slavery. Magic will be extinguished. This is a battle decision. Besides, no Mriswith has come yet. Just because they've attacked Aedendril, that doesn't mean they will attack anywhere else. Anyway, the spell hides my identity. No one knows the Mother Confessor is alive, or that I am she. They have no reason to come after me. Flawless logic. I can see why you were chosen as the Mother Confessor, but I still think it's foolhardy, Zed appealed to the sorceress. What do you think? I think the Mother Confessor be right. We must consider what be the most important action we can take. We must not risk everyone for a danger to a few. Kalin stood before Gratch. With the way he was squatting down, she was eye to eye with him. Gratch, Richard is in great danger. Gratch's tufted ears twitched. He needs Zed to help him, and you too. I'll be safe enough. No Mriswith have been here. Can you get Zed to Aidendril? He's a wizard and can make himself easy for you to carry. Will you do it for me? For Richard? Gratch's glowing eyes moved among the three of them, considering. At last he rose. His leathery wings spread as he nodded. Kalin hugged the gar, and he returned the tender embrace. Are you tired, Gratch? Do you want to rest, or can you leave right now? Gratch flapped his wings in answer. In growing alarm, Zed looked from one to the other. Bags, this is the most foolish thing I've ever done. If I was meant to fly, I'd have been born a bird. Kalin offered a weak smile. Jebra said she had a vision of you with wings. Zed planted his fists on his bony hips. She also said she saw me being dropped into a ball of fire. He tapped his foot. All right, let's get going then. Addie stood to seize him in a hug. You be a brave old fool, Zed grumbled in disgust. Fool indeed. He finally returned the embrace. He let out a sudden yelp when she pinched his bottom. You look handsome in your fine robes, old man. Zed was overcome with a helpless grin. Well, I guess I do. A frown returned. A little anyway. Take care of the mother confessor. When Richard finds out I left her to make her own way back, he may do more than pinch me. Kaylin threw her arms around the skinny wizard, feeling suddenly forsaken. Zed was Richard's grandfather, and it had made her feel at least a little better, having that much of Richard with her. When they parted, Zed cast a wincing glance to the gar. Well, Gratch, I guess we had best be on our way. In the cold night air, Kaylin caught the wizard's sleeve. Zed, you have to talk some sense into Richard. Her voice heated. He can't do this to me. He's being unreasonable. Zed studied her face in the dim light. He spoke softly at last. History is rarely made by reasonable men. Chapter 35 Don't touch anything, Richard reminded them again as he scowled over his shoulder. I mean it. The three moored Sith didn't answer. They turned to look up at the high ceiling of the arched entry, and then at the huge, intricately joined blocks of dark granite just inside the raised, massive portcullis, marking the entrance to the wizard's keep. Richard glanced back past Ulick and Egan to the wide road that had led them up the mountainside, and at last over a stone bridge 250 paces long that spanned a chasm with near vertical sides that dropped away for what seemed thousands of feet. He wasn't sure of the full depth of the yawning abyss, because in the far distance below, clouds hugging the ice-licked walls obscured the bottom. Walking over the bridge and looking down into that dark, jagged maw made him dizzy and lightheaded. He couldn't imagine how the stone bridge could have been erected over such an obstacle. Unless one had wings, there was but this single way into the keep. Lord Rawl's official escort of 500 men waited back on the other side of the bridge. They had intended to come with him into the keep, 
until they had reached that spot, having just rounded a switchback, and every eye, including his, had looked up at the vastness of the keep, its soaring walls of dark stone, its ramparts, bastions, towers, connecting passageways and bridges, all of which presented an unmistakable sensation of sinister menace jutting from the stone of the mountain, somehow looking alive as if it were watching them. Richard's knees had gone weak at the sight, and when he ordered them to wait there, none had raised so much as a single word of protest. It had taken considerable will for Richard to force himself to go on, but the idea of all those men seeing their Lord Rahl, their wizard, balk at going into the wizard's keep kept his feet moving when he would have wished otherwise. Besides, he needed to do this. Richard summoned courage by remembering Kaelin telling him that the keep was protected by spells and that there were places even she couldn't go because those spells so sapped one of courage that they couldn't proceed. That's all it was, he assured himself. Just a spell to keep the curious away. Only a feeling and not a real threat. It's warm here, Raina said, her dark eyes looking about in astonishment. Richard realized she was right. Once they were beyond the iron portcullis, the air had lost its chill with each step until it was like a fine spring day inside. The somber steel-gray sky into which the sheer mountainside ascended above the keep and bitter wind on the road up held no hint of spring, though. The snow on his boots was beginning to melt. They all took off their heavy mantles and tossed them in a pile to the side against the stone wall. Richard checked that his sword was clear in its scabbard. The towering arched opening they passed beneath was a good fifty feet long. Richard saw that it was merely a breach in the outer wall. Beyond, the road continued through an open area before tunneling into the base of a high stone wall and disappearing into the gloom beyond. Probably just went to the stables, he told himself. No reason to go in there. Richard had to resist the urge to shroud himself in his black Mriswith cape and become invisible. He had been doing that more and more of late, finding comfort not only in the solitude it provided, but in an odd, indefinably pleasurable sensation it invoked, almost like the reassurance of the magic of the sword at his hip, always there, always at his beck and call, always his ally and champion. All around, intricate junctures of masonry walls created, of the bleak courtyard, a craggy canyon, its walls dotted by a number of doors. Richard chose to follow a stepping stone path through the gravel of granite fragments to the largest of the doors. Berdine suddenly clutched his arm so hard he winced in pain, turning away from the door to pry off her fingers. Berdine, he said, what are you doing? What's the matter? He extricated his arm from her grasp, but she grabbed it again. Look, she finally said, in a tone of voice that made the hair at the back of his neck stand on end. What do you suppose that is? Everyone turned to see where she pointed with her aegeal. Rock fragments and stones rolled in waves, as if some huge stone fish swam beneath their surface. As the unseen thing underneath came closer, they all inched toward the center of their stepping stone. The gravel crunched and gnashed as it undulated in waves like water in a lake. Berdine's grasp on his arm tightened painfully as the crest of the waves approached. Even Ulick and Egan gasped with the rest of them as it seemed to pass beneath the stepping stones under their feet, the waves lapping stone chips up onto the rocks upon which they stood. Once beyond, the rolling movement of the gravel abated until all was still. All right, just what was that? Berdine blurted out. And what would have happened to us if we had gone a different way to one of the other doors instead of along the only path to this one? How should I know? She blinked up at him. You're a wizard. You're supposed to know these things. Berdine would have fought Ulick and Egan by herself without a second thought if he were to command it. But unseen magic was something altogether different. All five of them were fearless against steel, but none of them were the least bit shy about letting him see their anxiety toward magic. They had explained it to him any number of times. They were the steel against steel, so that he could be the magic against magic. Look, all of you, I've told you before that I don't know very much about being a wizard. I've never been to this place before. I don't know anything about it. I don't know how to protect you. Now, will you do as I asked and wait with the soldiers on the other side of the bridge? Please. Ulick and Egan folded their arms in mute reply. We're going with you, Kara insisted. That's right, Raina added. 
You can't stop us, Berdine said, as she finally released his arm. But it could be dangerous. And we must protect you, Berdine said. Richard scowled down at her. How, by squeezing the blood out of my arm? Berdine turned red. Sorry. Look, I don't know about the magic here. I don't know the dangers, much less how to stop them. That is why we must go, Kara explained with exaggerated patience. You don't know how to protect yourself. We might be of help. Who's to say that an Aegeal, she lifted a thumb to Ulick and Egan, or muscles aren't what will be needed? What if you fall down a simple hole with no leather, and there is no one to hear you call for help? You could be hurt by something not magic, you know, Richard sighed. Well, all right, I guess you have a point. He shook a finger at her. But if you get your foot bitten off by some stone fish or something, don't you complain to me about it. The three women grinned in satisfaction. Even Ulick and Egan smiled. Richard let out a weary sigh. Come on, then. He turned toward the twelve-foot-tall door set back in an alcove. The wood was gray and weathered and spanned with simple but massive iron straps spiked on with cut nails as big as his fingers. Above the door, words were carved in the stone lintel, but they were in a language none of them could understand. As Richard reached for the lever, the door began to move inward on silent hinges. And he says he doesn't know how to use his magic, Berdine mocked. Richard checked the resolve in their eyes one last time. Remember, don't touch anything. They nodded. He heaved a resigned sigh and turned toward the doorway, scratching the back of his neck. Didn't the unguent I brought rid you of your rash? Kara asked as they stepped through the doorway into the cheerless room beyond. It smelled of damp stone. No, not yet anyway. Inside the vast entry chamber, their voices echoed off the beamed ceiling, which was some thirty feet high. Richard slowed as he peered around the near empty room and came to a halt. The woman I bought it from promised me it would cure your rash. She said it was made with the usual common ingredients, like white rhubarb, juice of laurel, butter, and soft-boiled egg. But when I told her that it was most important, she added some special costly elements. She said she put in betony, pig's ulcer, a swallow's heart, and because I am your protector, she had me bring her my moon blood. She stirred it in with a red-hot nail. I stayed and watched, just to make sure. I wish you had told me this before I'd used it, Richard muttered as he started ahead into the gloomy chamber. What? He waved off her question. Well, I warned her that it had better work for the amount I paid, and told her that if it didn't, I would be back, and she would rue the day she failed. She promised it would work. You did remember to put some on your left heel, like I told you, didn't you? No, I just put it on the rash. Now he wished he hadn't. Kara threw her hands up. Well, no wonder. I told you that you had to put it on your left heel, too. The woman said the rash was probably a disruption in the basing of your aura, and you had to put it on your heel, too, to complete the connection to the earth. Richard only half listened to her. He knew she was merely trying to find courage in the sound of her own voice by keeping the subject mundane. High overhead to their right, a row of small windows poured long, slanting shafts of daylight across the room. Ornately carved wooden chairs stood watch to each side of an arched opening at the far end. Beneath the row of windows hung a tapestry, its image too faded to be discerned. The opposite wall held a row of candles in simple iron sconces. A heavy trestled table sat near the center of the room, bathed in a brilliant shaft of light. The room was otherwise bare. They crossed the floor, accompanied by the echoes of the sounds of their boots on the tiles. Richard saw that there were books on the table. His hopes elevated. Books were why he had come. It could be weeks yet before Kalin and Zed made it back, and he feared that he might need to take action to protect the keep before then. He was becoming restive and worried while he waited. With the Daharan army holding Aedendril, his biggest threat right now was an assault to seize the keep. He hoped to find books that might impart some knowledge, maybe even tell him how to use some of his magic, so that if someone with magic attacked, he might gain a key to warding them off. He feared the Order would try to snatch some of the magic preserved in the keep. Mrithwith, too, were in his thoughts. There were nearly a dozen books on the table all the same size. The words on the covers were not in a language he could understand. Ulick and Egan stood with their backs to the table while Richard slid some of the books aside with a finger to better see ones underneath. Something looked familiar about them. 
They look like the same book, but in different languages, he remarked, half to himself. He turned around one that caught his eye, so he could look at the title, and suddenly realized that though he couldn't read it, he had seen the language before, and he recognized two of the words. The first, fuer, and the third, ost, were words he knew only too well. The title was in High Daharan. A prophecy that Warren had shown him in the vaults at the Palace of the Prophets had referred to Richard, calling him Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka, the bringer of death. The first word in this title, Fuer, meant the, and the third, Ost, meant of. Fuer Ulbrecken Ost Brenica Dieser. Richard let out a frustrated sigh. I wish I knew what it meant. The Adventures of Bonnie Day, I think. Richard turned to see Berdine looking past his shoulder at the table. She stepped back, her blue eyes glancing away, as if she thought she had done something wrong. What did you say? he whispered. Berdine pointed at the book on the table. Fuer u brecken ost brenica dieser. You said you wished to know what it meant. I think it means the adventures of Bonnie Day. It's an old dialect. The Adventures of Bonnie Day was a book Richard had owned since his early youth. It had been his favorite book, and he had read it so often he practically knew it by heart. Only after going to the Palace of the Prophets in the Old World had he discovered that the book had been written by Nathan Rall, a prophet and Richard's ancestor. Nathan had written the book as a primer on prophecy, he said, and had given it to boys who had potential. Nathan had told Richard, that with the exception of Richard, all who had possessed the book had met with fatal accidents. When Richard was born, the prelate and Nathan had come to the new world and stolen the Book of Counted Shadows from the keep in order to prevent it from falling into Dark and Rawl's hands. They gave it to Richard's stepfather, George Cipher, and extracted his promise to make Richard memorize the entire book, word for word, and then destroy it. The Book of Counted Shadows was needed in order to open the boxes of Orden back in Dahara. Richard still knew that book by heart, every word. Richard remembered fondly the happy times of his youth, living at home with his father and brother. He had loved his older brother and looked up to him. Who knew then the treacherous turns life would take? There was no going back to those innocent times. Nathan had also left behind a copy of The Adventures of Bonnie Day for him. He must have also left these copies, in other languages, here at the keep when he had been here right after Richard had been born. How do you know what it says? Richard asked. Berdine swallowed. It's in High Deharan, but in old dialect of the tongue. Richard realized by the way her eyes had gone wide that he must have a frightening look on his face. He put in an effort to smooth his features. You mean to say that you understand High Deharan? She nodded. I was told that it's a dead language. A scholar I know who could understand Haida Haran told me that almost no one anymore knows it. How do you? From my father, she said. The emotion left her voice. It was one of the reasons Dark and Rall chose me to be more the Sith. Her face had gone emotionless, too. Few people still understand Haida Haran. My father was one of them. Dark and Rall used Haida Haran to work some of his magic, and he didn't like that there were others who knew the old tongue. Richard didn't have to ask what had happened to her father. I'm sorry, Berdine. He knew that in their training, those forced into the bondage of becoming moored Sith were compelled to torture their fathers to death. It was called the third breaking, their final test. She showed no reaction. She had retreated behind the iron mask of her training. Dark and Rawl knew that my father had taught me some of the old tongue, but being moored Sith, I was no threat to him. He consulted with me on occasion to hear my interpretation of various words. Haidaharan is a difficult language to translate. Many words, especially in the older dialects, have shades of meaning that can only be understood by their context. I am no expert by any means, but I understand some. Dark and Rawl was a master at Haidaharan. And do you know the meaning of Fuer Grisa Ost Drauka? A very ancient dialect. I'm not terribly well versed in versions that old, she thought a moment. I think the literal translation is the bringer of death. Where did you hear this? He didn't want to think of the complications of the other meanings at the moment. An old prophecy. 
It gives me this name. Berdine clasped her hands behind her back. Unfairly, Lord Rall. Unless it is in reference to your skill at handling your enemies, not your friends, Richard smiled. Thank you, Berdine. Her smile returned, like the sun from behind fading storm clouds. Let's go see what else we can find of interest in here, he said, heading for the arched opening at the far end of the chamber. As he went through the doorway, Richard felt a tingling, tickling sensation pass across his flesh in a razor's edged line. Once beyond the opening, it was gone. He turned when he heard Raina call his name. The rest of them on the other side pressed their hands up against the air as if it were a sheet of impenetrable glass. Ulick beat his fist against it, but to no avail. Lord Rall, Kara called out. How do we pass through? Richard returned to the doorway. I'm not sure. I have magic that allows me to pass shields. Here, Berdine, give me your hand. See if that will work. He stuck his hand back through the invisible barrier, and she gripped his wrist without hesitation. Slowly, he pulled her hand toward him until it penetrated the shield. Oh, that's cold, she complained. You all right? You want to try the rest of the way? When she nodded, he pulled her on. Once through, she shuddered and shook herself, as if she were crawling with bugs. Kara put her hand out toward the doorway. Now me. Richard began to reach for her, but stopped. No, the rest of you wait here until we come back. What? Kara shrieked. You have to take us with you. There are dangers I know nothing about. I can't be watching out for all of you and at the same time pay attention to what I'm doing. Berdine is enough in case I need protection. The rest of you wait here. If anything happens, you know how to get out. But you have to take us, Kara pleaded. We can't leave you without protection, she turned. Tell him, Ulick. She's right, Lord Rall. We should be with you. Richard shook his head. One is enough. If something happened to me, then you wouldn't be able to get back out through the shield. If anything happens and we don't return, I'm depending on you to carry on. If anything happens, you are in charge, Kara. If anything happens, get help for us, if you can. If you can't, well, take care of things until my grandfather Zed and Kalen get here. Don't do this! Kara looked more distraught than he had ever seen her. Lord Rall, we can't afford to lose you! Kara, it will be all right. We'll be back, I promise. Wizards always keep their promises. Kara huffed in anger. Why her? Berdine flipped her wavy brown braid back over her shoulder as she flashed Kara a self-satisfied smile. Because Lord Rall likes me best. Kara, Richard said as he scowled at Berdine. It's because you're the leader. If anything happens to me, I want you to be in charge. Kara stood a moment, considering. A self-satisfied smile of her own finally spread on her lips. All right. But you better never pull a trick like this again, Richard winked at her, if you say so. He looked up the gloomy corridor. Come on, Berdine. Let's go have a look around so we can finish and get out of this place. Chapter 36 Passageways ran in every direction. Richard tried to keep to what he thought was the main one so that he could find his way out. As they passed rooms, he stuck his head in to see if there were any books or anything else that might be helpful. Most were simple, empty stone rooms. A few had tables and chairs with chests or other plain furniture, but nothing of particular interest. One whole hall had rooms with beds. The wizards who stayed at the keep must have lived unassuming lives, at least some of them. There were thousands of rooms, and he had seen only a few. Berdine peeked past him whenever he looked into a room to see what he was seeing. Do you know where we are going? Not exactly. He glanced off down another side hall. The place was a labyrinth. But I think we should find some stairs. Start at the bottom and work our way up. She pointed back over her shoulder. I saw some down the hall to our left, just back there. The stairs were where she said they would be. He hadn't noticed them because it was just a hole in the floor with spiral stone steps descending down into darkness. And he had been looking for a stairwell. Richard reprimanded himself for not thinking to bring a lamp or candle. He had a flint and steel in his pocket and guessed that if he could find some straw or old cloth, he could get a small flame going and light one of the candles he had seen in iron sconces. As they descended into the darkness, Richard felt, as well as heard, a low hum coming from below. The stone, which had been disappearing in darkness, began to reveal itself in a bluish-green light, as if someone were turning up the wick on a lamp. 
By the time they reached the bottom of the steps, he could see clearly in the eerie light. Just around the corner at the bottom of the steps, he found the source of the light. In a ringed iron bracket sat a globe, about as wide as his hand, and looking to be glass. It was the origin of the light. Berdine looked up at him, her face outlined in the strange illumination. What makes it glow? Well, there's no flame, so I would guess it has to be magic. Richard cautiously reached toward the light. It brightened. He touched a finger to it, and the bluish-green cast changed to a warmer yellow color. Since touching it seemed to cause no harm, Richard carefully lifted it from the bracket. It was heavier than he expected. Rather than being a hollow sphere of brown glass, it seemed to be solid. In his hand, it threw off a warm, useful light. Richard could see that far off down the tunnel-like hall, there were other such spheres in brackets. In the distance, the closest barely glowed with bluish-green light. As they passed them, each brightened at his approach and dimmed as he moved on with the one he had taken. At an intersection, the hall joined a wider, more welcoming corridor. Light pink stone ran in a band down both sides, and at places the passageway opened into cavernous rooms with padded benches. Opening the wide double doorways in one of the corridor's big rooms, he discovered a library. The library looked cozy and inviting with its polished wood floor, paneled walls, and whitewashed ceiling. There were tables beside the rows of shelves and comfortable-looking chairs. Glassed windows at the far side overlooked the city of Aidendrill and made the room bright and airy. He moved on to the next cavernous chamber in the hall and discovered that it, too, had a library off of it. It appeared that the corridor ran parallel to the face of the keep and along a whole row of libraries. They found another two dozen of the huge library rooms by the time they reached the end of the corridor. Richard had never imagined that this many books existed. Even the vaults at the Palace of the Prophets, with all the books it held, seemed sparse to him after seeing this many volumes. It would take a year just to read all the titles. He felt suddenly overwhelmed. Where was he to start? This must be what you were looking for, she said. Richard frowned. No, it's not. I don't know why, but this isn't it. This is too ordinary. Berdine walked beside him as they moved on through passageways and down several stories when they came to a stairwell, her Aegeel swinging on the chain at her wrist and ever at the ready. At the bottom of the stairs stood an ornate gold-leafed doorframe before a chamber beyond that, rather than stonework, had been excavated from inky rock, perhaps once a cave that had been enlarged. In places where the rock had been broken away, it left behind glossy, sharp facets. Fat columns looked to have been left in places as the rock had been carved out in order to support a low, craggy ceiling. At the gold doorway, Richard encountered a shield for the fourth time since he had entered the keep, but this was different than the first three. The first three all had the same feel. This was nothing like the others. As he put his hand through, the vertical plane between the doorframe glowed red from no visible source, and the sensation, instead of the tingling, was hot where the red light touched him. It was the most uncomfortable shield he had ever felt. He feared it might singe the hair off his arm, but it didn't. Richard pulled his arm back. This one is different. If it's more than you want to do, you stop me. He put his arms around Berdine to better protect her. She tensed. Don't worry. I'll stop if you want me to. She nodded, and he shuffled into the doorway. When the red light touched the red leather on her arm, she flinched. It's all right, she said. Keep going. He pulled her through and released her. Only after he took his arms from around her did she seem to relax. The glow of the sphere Richard held out cast sharp shadows among the columns and he could see that there were small recesses carved in the stone all around the room. At the wall around the edge of the room, there were perhaps 60 or 70 such niches. Though he couldn't make out what was in them, he could tell that each held objects of different sizes and shapes. Richard felt the hairs on the back of his neck stiffen as his gaze swept over the nooks from a distance. He didn't know what the things were, but he instinctively knew that they were more than dangerous. Stay close to me, he told her. We want to stay away from the walls. He pointed with his chin across the vast room. Over there. That passageway is where we want to go. How do you know? Look at the floor. The rough, natural stone was worn smooth in a winding track cutting across the center of the chamber. We'd better stay on this path. Her blue eyes glanced up in unease. You be careful. 
If anything happens to you, I'll never be able to get out of this place to get help from the others. I'll be trapped down here. Richard smiled and then started out across the dead silent cavern. Well, that's the risk you take for being my favorite. Her unease didn't diminish at his attempt to lighten the mood. Lord Dhrall, do you really think that I believe I am your favorite? Richard checked that they were still on the path. Berdine, I only said that because it's what you always say. She thought in silence as they moved cautiously across the room. Lord Dhrall, may I ask you a question? A serious question, a personal question? Sure. She pulled her wavy brown braid over her shoulder and held on to it. When you marry your queen, you will still have other women, won't you? Richard frowned down at her. I don't have other women now. I love Kaelin. I'm loyal in my love to her. But you are the Lord Rall. You can have any you wish, even me. That is what the Lord Rall does. He has many women. You have but to snap your fingers. Richard got the distinct impression that she was definitely not making an offer. Is this about when I put my hand on you, on your breast? She glanced away and nodded. Berdine, I did that to help you, not because... Well, not because of anything else. I hope you would know that. She quickly laid a concerned hand on his arm. I do know. That's not what I mean. You've never touched me in the other way. What I mean is that you never make those requirements of me. She chewed her lower lip. The way you put your hand on me had me feeling very ashamed. Why? because you risked your life to help me. You are my Lord Rahl, and I have not been honest with you. Richard gestured, guiding them on the path around a column twenty men couldn't have held hands around. You're getting me confused, Berdine. Will I say that I am your favorite so that you will not think I don't like you? You are trying to say you don't like me? She clutched her arm again. Oh, no, I love you. Berdine, I told you, I have... Not like that. I mean, I love you as my Lord Rahl. You have freed me. You have seen that I am more than simply Maud Sith, and you have trusted me. You saved my life and returned me to whole. I love you for the kind of Lord Rahl you are. Richard shook his head as if to clear it. You're not making any sense. What does this have to do with you always saying that you're my favorite? I say that so you won't think I wouldn't willingly go to your bed if asked. I feared that if you knew that I didn't want to, then you would force me to be perverse. Richard held the light out as they reached the passageway leading from the room. It looked a simple block hall. Stop fretting about it. He motioned her onward. I've told you I wouldn't. I know. And after what you did, she touched her left breast. I believe you. But I didn't before. I'm beginning to see that you really are different in more ways than a few. Different from who? Dark and raw. Well, you're right about that. As they walked on down the long hall, again he suddenly looked at her. Are you trying to tell me that you're in love with someone, and you have only been saying those things to me so that I wouldn't think you were trying to avoid my affections, and therefore wouldn't be provoked to force you? Her fist tightened on her braid as her blue eyes closed for a moment. Yes. Really? I think that's wonderful, Berdine. At the end of the hall, they came to a broad room, the walls lined with bundled tufts of fur and hair hanging from framed panels. Richard studied the displays from a distance. He recognized one tuft as gar fur. Richard looked over as he started out again and grinned. Who is it? He waved his hand, feeling a sudden flush of embarrassment that, considering her odd mood at the moment, he might be overstepping his bounds. Unless you don't want to tell me. You don't have to tell me. I don't want you to feel you have to. It's your business if you choose. Berdine swallowed. Because of the things you have done for us, for me, I wish to confess... Richard made a face. Confess? Telling me who you're in love with isn't a confession, it's Raina. Richard's mouth snapped shut. He looked back to the way they were going. Green tiles, left foot only. Right foot only on the white ones, until we cross this space. Don't skip a green or white tile. Touch the pedestal before you step from the last tile. She followed him as he stepped carefully from the green to the white tiles, until they had reached the stone floor on the other side, touched the pedestal, and moved into a tall, narrow corridor of sparkling silver stone, like a cleft in a huge jewel. How did you know that? The green tile, white tile business. What? He glanced back with a frown. I don't know, it must have been a shield or something. He looked back to her as she walked with her eyes on the floor. Berdine, I love Raina too. And Kara and you, and Ulick and Egan. Kind of like a family, is that what you mean? 
She shook her head without looking up. But Raina is a woman. Berdine shot him a cool scowl. Berdine, he said after a long silence. You had better not tell Raina this, or Raina loves me too. Richard straightened, not knowing quite what to say. But how can... You can't... I don't see... Berdine, why are you telling me this? Because you have always been honest with us. At first, when you told us things, we thought you would not do as you said. Well, not all of us. Kara has always believed you, but I did not. Her expression slipped back to the distant countenance of a moored Sith. When Darkin Rall was our Lord Rall, he found out, and he ordered me to his bed. He laughed at me. He liked to take me to his bed because he knew. It was his way of humiliating me. I thought that if you knew too, you would do the same, so I tried to hide it from you by making you think I fancied you. Richard shook his head. Berdine, I wouldn't do that to you. I know that now. That is why I had to confess to you, because you've always been honest with me, but I was not honest with you. Richard shrugged. Well, then I'm glad you feel better. He thought as he turned her down a winding hall of plastered walls. Did Dark and Rall make you this way? By choosing you to become a moored Sith? Is that what made you hate men? She frowned up at him. I do not hate men. I just... I don't know. I just always looked at girls from the time I was young. Boys didn't interest me in that way. She drew her hand down her braid. Now you hate me? No. No, I don't hate you, Berdine. You are my protector, the same as always. But can't you try to not think about her or something? It just isn't right. She smiled distantly. When Raina smiles at me in her special way and the day is suddenly wonderful, it seems right. When she touches my face and my heart races, it seems right. I know my heart is safe in her care. Her smile withered. But now you think I am despicable. Richard looked away, shame coming over him in a cold wave. That's the way I feel about Kaelin. One time my grandfather said I should forget about her, but there was no way I could. Why would he say that? Richard couldn't tell her that it was because Kaelin was a confessor and Zed was doing it for Richard's best interest. No one was supposed to be able to love a confessor. He felt bad that he couldn't be honest with Berdine now. He shrugged. He didn't think she was the one for me. Richard pulled her through another of the tingly kind of shields when they reached the end of the hall. The triangular room had a bench. He sat her down beside him and set the glowing ball between them. Berdine, I think I can see how you feel. I know how I felt when my grandfather said I should forget Kalen. No one else can tell you what to feel. You either do or you don't. Though I don't understand or approve of this, all of you are becoming my friends. Being a friend means you don't have to be exactly alike, and you are still friends. Lord Rall, I know that you can never accept me, but I had to tell you. Tomorrow I will return to Dahara. You should not have to have one you do not approve of as your guard. Richard thought a minute. Do you like boiled peas? Berdine frowned. Yes. Well, I hate boiled peas. Does that make you like me any less because I dislike something you like? Or make you want to abandon being my protector? She made a face. Lord Rall, this is different from boiled peas. How can you have faith in someone you do not approve of? It's not that I don't approve of you, Bertine. It's just that to me it doesn't seem right. But it doesn't have to. Look, I had a friend when I was younger, another woods guide. Giles and I spent a lot of time together because we had a lot in common. He fell in love with Lucy Fleckner. I hated Lucy Fleckner. She was cruel to Giles. I couldn't understand how he could care for her. I didn't like her, and I thought he should feel the same. I lost my friend because he couldn't be the way I thought he should be. I didn't lose him because of Lucy. I lost him because of me. I lost all the good things we had because I wasn't willing to let him be who he was. I've always regretted what I lost. I guess this is something like that. As you learn to be other than Mord Sith, like I learned as I grew up, you'll find that being a friend is to like a person for who they are even the parts you don't understand. The reasons you like them makes the things you don't understand unimportant. You don't have to understand or do the same or live their lives for them. If you truly care for them, then you want them to be who they are. That was why you liked them in the first place. I like you, Berdine, and that's all that matters. True? True. She put her arms around his neck and hugged him. Thank you, Lord Rall. 
After you saved me, I feared you would wish you hadn't. I'm glad I told you now. Raina will be relieved to know you will not do to us as Doc and Rall did. As they stood, a part of the stone wall slid to the side. Richard took her hand and led her from the odd room through the new doorway, down a stairway, and through a dank, wet room with a stone floor that mounded into a huge hump in the center. If we are becoming your friends, then I can tell you what you did that I don't like, what I don't approve of, and how you did a wrong? Richard nodded. I don't like what you did to Kara. She is angry at what you did to her. Richard glanced back in the strange room that seemed to swallow the light. Kara? Angry with me? What did I do to her? You have treated her badly because of me. When Richard wrinkled his face in puzzlement, she went on. When I was under that spell and I threatened you with my Aegeel, after you came back from looking for Brogan, you became angry with all of us. You treated them like they had done it too, although it was only I. I didn't know what was going on. I felt threatened by Mord Sith because of what you did. She should realize that. She does. But when you found out at last and made me whole again, you never told Kara and Raina that you were wrong to treat them as if they had threatened you the same as I. They did not. Richard felt his face flush in the darkness. You're right. Now I feel terrible. Why didn't she say something? Berdine lifted an eyebrow. You are Lord Rall. If you decided to beat her because you did not like the way she said good morning, she would not say anything. Then why are you saying something? Berdine followed him into a strange corridor with a cobblestone floor only two feet wide and smooth, round, tube-like walls covered completely in gold. Because you are my friend. As he looked over his shoulder and smiled his thanks, she reached out to touch the gold. Richard snatched her wrist before she could touch it. Do that and you're dead. She frowned at him. Why do you tell us that you do not know anything about this place, and then you walk through it like you have lived here your whole life? Richard blinked at the question. His eyes suddenly went wide with the realization. Because of you. Me? Yes, Richard said in astonishment. By talking to me, you distracted my conscious mind. You had me so intent on the things you were saying and on thinking about them that it let my gift guide me. I never even realized it as it was happening. Now that I've been through this way, I know the dangers and the way back. I can get back now. He squeezed her shoulder. Thank you, Berdine, she grinned. What are friends for? I think we're through the worst. This way. At the end of the gold tunnel was a round tower room at least a hundred feet across with stairs spiraling up around the inside of the outer wall. At irregular intervals, small landings interrupted the steps at doors. In the gloomy expanse above, shafts of light pierced the darkness. Most of the windows above were small, but one looked huge. Richard couldn't tell for sure how far the tower rose, but it had to be close to 200 feet. Below, the circular shaft descended into dank obscurity. I don't like the looks of it, Berdine said, as she peered over the edge of the iron rail at the landing. This looks like the worst of it to me. Richard thought he saw something move in the murk below. Stay close and keep your eyes open. He fixed his gaze on the spot where he thought he had seen movement, trying to see it again. If anything happens, you have to try to get out. Berdine glanced with disapproval over the railing. Lord Raal, it has taken us hours to get down here. We have been through more shields than I can remember. If anything happens to you, I am dead too. Richard considered his options. It might be better if he were cloaked in his Mriswith cape. You wait here. I'll go have a look. Berdine snatched his shirt at his shoulder and yanked him around to face her fiery blue eyes. No, you will not go alone. Berdine, I am your protector. You will not go alone. Is that understood? She had that penetrating iron look in her eyes that made his tongue fear a mistake. He finally let out a breath. All right, but you stay close and do as I say. She cocked her head. I always do as you say. Chapter 37 As his horse swayed under him, Tobias Brogan idly watched the creator's five messengers walking not far ahead and off to one side. It was unusual to see them. Since they had unexpectedly appeared four days earlier, they were always around, but rarely seen. And even when they were visible, they were still hard to see, being all white like the snow, or when it was dark, all black like the night. He marveled at the way they were able to simply vanish before his eyes. The Creator's power was indeed miraculous. 
His choice of messengers, though, left Tobias uneasy. The creator had told Tobias in his dreams not to question his plans, and thankfully had finally accepted Tobias's supplications of forgiveness for the effrontery of an inquiry. All right-minded children feared the creator, and Tobias Brogan was nothing if not right-minded. Still, the scaled creatures hardly seemed the appropriate choice to carry divine guidance. He suddenly straightened in his saddle. Of course, the creator wouldn't want to reveal his intentions to the profane by letting them see disciples who looked the part. Evil would expect the beauty and glory of the creator to hound them, but would not be spooked to go to ground at the sight of disciples in his guise. Tobias let out a relieved sigh as he watched the Mriswith leaning in, conferring with one another, and with the sorceress in whispers. She called herself a sister of the light, but she was still a sorceress, a streganicha, a witch. He could understand the creator using the Mriswith as messengers, but he couldn't understand why he would give Streganicha such authority. Tobias wished he knew what they had to talk about all the time. Ever since the Streganicha had joined them the day before, she had kept company almost exclusively with the five scaled creatures, having precious few words for the Lord General of the Blood of the Fold. The six of them kept to themselves, as if they only happened to be traveling the same direction as Tobias and his company of a thousand. Tobias had seen but a handful of the Mriswith dispatch hundreds of Daharan soldiers, and so felt less uneasy about only having two fists of his men with him. The rest of his force, of over a hundred thousand of the fold, waited a little more than a week out of Aidendril. Tobias had been told by the Creator, when he had come in a dream that first night with his army, that they were to remain behind to participate in the conquest of Aidendril. Lonetta he said in a quiet tone, as he watched the sister gesticulating in her conversation with the Mriswith. She stepped her horse closer to his right side. She took his cue and kept her voice low. Yes, my lord general. Lunetta, have you seen the sister use her power? Yes, lord general, when she moved the windfall from our way. Could you tell her power from that? Lunetta gave a slight nod. Does she have the power you do, my sister? No, Tobias. He smiled over at her. That be good to know. He glanced around to make sure no one was near and the six were still visible. I am becoming puzzled by some of the things the Creator has been telling me in the last few nights. Do you wish to tell Lunetta? Yes, but not now. We'll talk about it later. She idly stroked her pretties. Perhaps when we can be alone. It be time to stop soon. Tobias didn't miss the demure smile or the offer. We'll not be stopping early tonight. He lifted his nose as he took a deep whiff of the cold air. She's so close I can almost smell her. Richard counted the landings on his way down so he would be able to find their way back. He thought he could remember the rest of it because of the sights along the way, but the inside of the tower was disorienting. It smelled of rot, like a deep bog, probably because water that came in the open windows collected in the bottom. At the next landing platform, Richard saw a shimmering to the air as he approached. In the light coming from the globe he was holding, he could see something standing to the side. Its edges glowed in the humming light. Though the thing wasn't solid, he recognized it as a mriswif, standing with its cape drawn around itself. Welcome, skin brother, it hissed. Berdine flinched. What was that? she whispered urgently. Richard caught hold of her wrist as she tried to put herself in front of him. She had her aegeal in her fist and pulled her to the other side of him as he continued on. It's just a Mriswith. Mriswith, she whispered in a hoarse tone. Where? Right here on the landing by the rail. Don't be afraid, it won't hurt you. She clutched his black cape after he forced down her arm with the Aegeal. They stepped onto the landing. Have you come to wake the Sliff? The Mriswith asked. Richard frowned. Sliff? The Mriswith opened its cape to point with the three-bladed knife in its claw down the stairs. When it did so, it became solid and fully visible, a figure of dusky scales and cape. The sliff is down there, skin brother. Its beady eyes came back up. She is accessible at last. Soon it will be time for the Yabri to sing. Yabri? The Mriswith lifted its three-bladed knife and gave it a little wiggle. Its slit of a mouth widened into sort of a smile. Yabri, when the Yabri sing, it will be the time of the queen. The queen? 
The queen needs you, skin brother. You must help her. Richard could feel Berdine trembling as she pressed against him. He decided that he should be going before she became too frightened and started down the steps. Two landings down, she was still hanging on to him. It's gone, she whispered in his ear. Richard looked back up and saw that she was right. Berdine muscled him into the recess of a doorway, flattening his back up against a wood door. Her penetrating blue eyes were intense with agitation. Lord Thrall, that was a Mriswith. Richard nodded, a little puzzled by her ragged panting. Lord Thrall, Mriswith killed people. You always killed them. Richard lifted a hand toward the landing above. It wasn't going to hurt us. I told you that. It didn't attack us, did it? There was no need to harm it. Her brow furrowed with concern. Lord Thrall, are you all right? I'm fine. Now come on. Maybe the Mriswith gave us a good hint of what we might be looking for. She shoved him back against the door when he tried to move. Why did it call you Skin Brother? I don't know. I guess because it has scales and I have skin. I think it called me that to let me know it meant no harm. It wanted to help. Help? She repeated incredulously. It didn't try to stop us, did it? She finally let go of his shirt, but it took longer for her blue eyes to release their hold on him. At the bottom of the tower, a walkway with an iron railing ringed the outside wall of the tower. In the center lurked black water, with rocks breaking the surface in several places. Salamanders clung to the stone below the walkway and rested partially submerged at the rocks. Insects swam through the thick, inky water, skittering around bubbles that occasionally ascended to release rings as they burst. Halfway around the walkway, Richard knew he had found what he was looking for. Something not ordinary, like the libraries, or even the strange rooms and corridors. A wide platform in the walkway before where a door had been was littered with sooty stone fragments, chips, and dust. Chunks of wood from the door now floated in the dark water beyond the iron railing. The doorway itself had been blown away and was now perhaps twice its previous size. The jagged edges were blackened, and in some places the stone itself was melted like candle wax. Twisting streaks on the stone wall ran off in every direction away from the blasted hole, as if lightning had flailed against the wall and burned it. This is not old, Richard said, running his finger through the black soot. How can you tell? Verdine asked as she peered about. Look, see here? The mold and slime have been burned away, scoured right off the rock, and haven't had time to grow back. This happened recently, sometime within the last few months. The room inside was round, perhaps 60 feet across, its walls scorched in ragged lines as if lightning had gone wild in the place. A circular stone wall took up the center, like a huge well, nearly half the width of the room. Richard leaned over the waist-high wall, holding out the glowing globe. The smooth stone walls of the hole fell away forever. He could see the stone for hundreds of feet before the light failed to penetrate farther. It looked bottomless. Above was a domed ceiling nearly as high as the room was wide. There were no windows or other doors. To the far side, Richard could see a table and a few shelves. When they rounded the well, he saw the body lying on the floor beside a chair. All that was left were bones inside a few scraps of cloth robes. Most of the robes had long ago rotted away, leaving the skeleton encircled by just a leather belt. Sandals remained, too. When he touched the bones, they crumbled like baked dirt. He has been here a very long time, Berdine said. You're right about that. Lord Rall, look. Richard stood and looked at the table where she pointed. There was an inkwell, dry for perhaps centuries, a pen to the side, and an open book. Richard leaned over and blew a cloud of dust and stone chips from the book. It's in High Daharan, he said, as he held it up next to the glowing sphere. Let me see. Her eyes moved from side to side as she studied the strange characters. You're right. What does it say? She carefully took the book in both hands. This is very old. The dialect is older than any I have ever seen. Doc and Rawl showed me an old dialect that he said was over 2,000 years old. She looked up. This is older. Can you read it? I could only understand a bit of the book we found when we came in the keep. She considered the last page with writing on it. I understand much less of this, she said as she turned some of the pages back. Richard gestured impatiently. Well, can you understand any of it? She stopped turning and scrutinized the writing. 
I think it says something about finally having success, but that success means he will die here, she pointed. See? Drauka. That word is the same, I think. Death. Berdine looked at the blank leather cover, then turned back through the book, scanning the pages. Her blue eyes came up at last. I think it's a journal. I think this is the journal of the man who died in here. Richard felt goosebumps dance up his arms. Verdine, this is what I was looking for. This is something not ordinary, not a book others have seen, like in the library. Can you translate it? A bit, perhaps, but not much. Her features sagged with disappointment. I'm sorry, Lord Rall. I just don't know dialects this old. It's the same problem I would have with the book we saw at first. I don't know enough of the words to be able to fill in the blanks correctly. I would only be guessing. Richard pinched his lower lip as he thought. He looked down at the bones, wondering what this wizard had been doing in this room, and what had kept it sealed, and worse yet, what had unsealed it. Richard twisted back to her. Verdine, that book upstairs, I know that book. I know the story. If I helped you telling you what I remember of what it says, could that help you decipher the words and then use those translated words to help translate this journal? As she considered, her face brightened. If we work together, it might. If you could tell me what a sentence says, then I would be able to know the meaning of words I don't recognize. We might be able to do it. Richard carefully closed the journal. You hold on to this with your life. I'll hold the light. Let's get out of here. We have what we came for. When he and Berdine came through the doorway, Kara and Raina practically leapt out of their skin with relief. Richard even saw Ulick and Egan close their eyes with a sigh and a silent thank you to the good spirits for a prayer answered. There are Mriswith in the keep, Berdine told the other two women at their tumbling questions. Kara gasped. How many did you have to kill, Lord Rao? None. They didn't attack us. We weren't in danger from them. But there were enough other dangers. He waved off her furious questions. We'll talk about it later. With Berdine's help, I found what I was looking for. He tapped the journal in Berdine's hands. We need to get back and start translating it. He picked up the book from the table and gave it to Berdine. As he started for the doorway out, he stopped and turned back to Kara and Raina. Uh, while I was down there and I was thinking that I could be killed if I did something wrong, it came to me that I didn't want to die without telling you two something. Richard put his hands in his pockets as he stepped closer. I realized when I was down there that I never told you that I was sorry for the way I treated you both. You did not know Berdine was under a spell, Lord Rall, Kara said. We don't blame you for wanting to keep us all at arm's length. I didn't know Berdine was under a spell, but I do now, and I want you to know that I wrongfully thought ill of you. You never gave me cause. I'm sorry. I hope you can forgive me. Smiles warmed Kara and Raina's faces. He didn't think they had ever looked less like Mord Sith than at that moment. We forgive you, Lord Rall, Kara said. Raina nodded her agreement. Thank you. What happened down there, Lord Rall? Raina asked. We had a talk about friendship, Berdine answered. At the base of the Keep Road, where the city of Aidendrill started and other roads joined to come into the city, stood a small market, nothing like the one on Stenter Street, but it looked to serve those arriving with a variety of goods. As Richard was moving past with his five bodyguards around him and his escort of troops marching behind, something caught his eye in the fading light and he came to a halt before a small, rickety table. Would you like one of your honey cakes, Lord Raoul? A small, familiar voice asked. Richard smiled down at the little girl. How many do you still owe me? The girl turned. Grandmama? The old woman rose to her feet, clutching the tattered blanket to herself as her faded blue eyes fixed on Richard. My, my, she said with a grin, showing the gaps from missing teeth. Lord Raoul can have as many as he wants, dear. She bowed her head. So good to see you well, my Lord Rahl. You too, he waited for her name. Valdora, she said. She stroked a hand down the little girl's light brown hair. And this is Holly. Pleased to see you again, Valdora and Holly. What are you doing here instead of Stenter Street? Valdora shrugged under her blanket. With the new Lord Rahl making the city safe, more people are coming all the time. And perhaps there will even be activity at the Wizard's Keep once again. We hope to catch some of these new people. 
Well, I don't think I'd put my hopes in the keep thriving again anytime soon, but you will certainly have first chance at those come new to Aiden Drill. Richard surveyed the cakes on her table. How many do I still have coming? Valdora chuckled. I would have a lot of baking to do to catch up with what we owe you, Lord Raal. Richard winked at her. Tell you what, if I could have one each for these five friends of mine and one for myself, we will bargain it as even. Valdora's gaze passed over his five guards. She bowed her head again. Done, Lord Raal. You have brought me more satisfaction than you could know. Chapter 38 As Verna hurried toward the gate to the prelate's compound, she noticed Kevin Andelmere standing guard in the darkness. She was impatient to get to the sanctuary to tell Anne that she had at last figured it out, and she now knew almost every one of the sisters loyal to the light, but she hadn't seen Kevin in weeks. Despite her heart-pounding rush, she stopped. Kevin, is that you? The young soldier bowed. Yes, prelate. I haven't seen you around for quite a time, have I? No, prelate. Bullis Dunn, Walsh, and I were called back to our command. Why? Kevin shifted his weight. I'm not sure exactly. My commander was curious about the spell over the palace, I think. I've known him for near to 15 years, and he's aged. He wanted to see with his own eyes if it were true that we hadn't. He said Bolasdun, Walsh, and I looked the same as we did when he first saw us 15 years ago. He said he had doubted it when he heard it said, but he believed it now. He had his commanders who knew us come look for themselves. Verna felt her forehead break out with beads of perspiration. With a cold wash of understanding, she knew why the emperor was coming to the palace of the prophets. She had to tell the prelate. There was no time to lose. Kevin, are you a loyal soldier of the empire, of the imperial order? Kevin slid his hand up on his pike. His voice hesitated. Yes, prelate. I mean, when the order conquered my homeland, I had little choice. I was made a soldier in the order. I fought for a time up north, near the wilds. Then, when the Order took over our kingdom, I was told I was a soldier for the Order and assigned to the palace. Can't get a better guard job than this. I'm glad to be back guarding your compound. Bullas Dunn and Walsh are glad to be back, too, to their posts at the Prophet's compound. My officers have always treated me decent, at least, and I always get paid. It's not much, but it always comes, and I see plenty of people who have no work and have a hard time eating. Verna put a gentle hand to his arm. Kevin, what do you think of Richard? Richard? A grin came over his face. I liked Richard. He bought me expensive chocolates for me to give my lady. Is that all he means to you? Chocolates? He scratched his eyebrow. No, I didn't mean it that way. Richard was a good man. Do you know why he bought you those chocolates? Because he was nice. He cared about people. Verna nodded. Yes, he did. He hoped that by giving you chocolates, when the time came for him to escape, it would make you see him as a friend and keep you from fighting him so he wouldn't have to kill you. He didn't want you as an enemy trying to kill him. Kill him? Prelate, I would never have... If he hadn't been kind to you, you might have been loyal to the palace first and tried to stop him. He glanced at the ground. I've seen him use his sword. I guess the gift was more than chocolates. That it was. Kevin, if a time comes and you have to choose, Richard or the Order... Which would you choose? His face twisted in discomfort. Prelate, I'm a soldier. He let out a groan. But Richard is a friend. I guess that if I had to, I'd be hard-pressed to raise a weapon against a friend. Any of the palace guard would be. They all like him. She squeezed his arm. Be loyal to your friends, Kevin, and you will be all right. Be loyal to Richard, and it will save you. He nodded. Thank you, Prelate. But I don't fear I will have to choose. Kevin, listen to me. The Emperor is an evil man. Kevin didn't say anything. You just remember that. And keep my words to yourself, will you? Yes, Prelate. As Verna marched into her outer office, Phoebe came halfway out of her chair when she saw her. Good evening, Prelate. I have to pray for guidance, Phoebe. No visitors. Something Kevin had said abruptly snagged in her mind. It didn't make sense. Guards Bullisdon and Walsh have been assigned to the Prophet's compound. We don't have a prophet. Find out why they're there and who ordered it, and give me a report first thing in the morning. Verna shook a finger. First thing. Verna. Phoebe sank back into her chair and looked down to her desk. Sister Dulcinea turned her white face away, putting her attention to her reports. Verna, there are some sisters here to see you. 
they wait inside. I gave no one permission to wait in my office. Phoebe didn't look up. I know, Prelate, but I'll see to this. Thank you, Phoebe. Verna was masked in a furious scowl as she stormed into her office. No one was allowed in her office without her explicit permission. She didn't have time to waste with nonsense. She had figured out how to tell the Sisters of the Light from the Sisters of the Dark, and she knew why Emperor Jagang was coming to Tanamura, to the Palace of the Prophets. She had to send a message to Anne. She had to know what she was to do. She saw the figures of four women in the dark room as she closed the distance. What is the meaning of this? Verna recognized Sister Leoma as she stepped forward into the candlelight. And then, in a blinding flash of pain, the world went black. Do as I say, Nathan. He leaned down toward her quite a distance, considering their difference in height, and gnashed his teeth. You could at least give me access to my Han. How can I protect you? Anne watched in the darkness as the column of 500 men followed the Lord Raal up the street. I don't want you to protect me. We can't take the chance. You know what to do. You must not interfere until he has rescued me, or we won't have a chance of capturing one so dangerous. What if he doesn't rescue you? Anne tried not to think of that possibility. She tried not to think of what was going to happen, even if events took the correct fork. Must I now lecture a prophet on prophecy? You must let it happen. Afterward, I will remove the block. Now, take the horses to a stable for the night. Make sure they are well fed. Nathan snatched the reins from her. Have it your way, woman. He turned back. You had better hope that I never get this collar off, or we are going to have a very long talk. You won't be able to do a proper job of holding up your end of the conversation, though, because you will be bound and gagged at the time. Anne chuckled. Nathan, you're a good man. I trust in you. You must trust in me. He shook a finger at her. If you get yourself killed, I know, Nathan. He growled. And they say I'm the one who is mad. He turned back to her. At least you could get yourself something to eat. You haven't eaten all day. There's a market just over there. Promise me you will at least have something to eat. I'm not. Promise me. Anne sighed. All right, Nathan, if it will make you happy, I will have something to eat, but I'm not very hungry. He lifted a finger in admonition. I said I promise. Now go on. After he had finally stormed off with the horses, she proceeded on toward the keep. Her stomach churned with the fear of walking into a prophecy blind. She didn't like the idea of going to the keep again, but she liked it even less considering the prophecy involved. Still, she had to do this. It was the only way. Honey cake, ma'am? They're only a penny and quite good. Anne looked down at a little girl in a big coat standing behind a rickety table. Honey cake. Well, she hadn't promised what she would eat. A honey cake would do. Anne smiled at the pretty face. All alone, out here at night? The girl turned and pointed. No, milady. My grandmama is here with me. A squat woman was curled up, all covered over in a tattered blanket, apparently asleep. Anne fished around in a pocket and pulled out a coin. A silver for you, my dear. You look to need it more than I. Oh, thank you, milady. She pulled a honey cake from under the table. Please take this one. It's one of the special ones with the most honey. I save them for the nicest people who stop at my stand. Anne smiled as she took the honey cake. Well, thank you, my dear. As Anne started up the road to the keep, the little girl began packing up her things. Anne savored the sweet honey cake as she eyed the people milling about the small market, looking for one who would be trouble. She didn't see any who looked dangerous, but she knew one was. She put her attention back to the road. What would be, would be. She wondered if it would really ease the anxiety if she knew how it would come. Probably not. In the darkness, no one saw her take the road to the keep, and at last she was alone. She wished Nathan were with her, but in a way it was nice to be alone at last, if only for a brief time. It did give her time, without Nathan's presence, to think about her life and what changes this would mean. So many years. In a way, what she was doing was like condemning to death those she loved. What choice had she? Page 324. She licked her fingers clean when she finished the honey cake. It hadn't settled her stomach, as she had hoped it would. By the time she crossed under the iron portcullis, her stomach was in churning turmoil. What was wrong with her? She had faced dangers before. Maybe as she got older, she found life more precious, 
and held on more tenaciously, fearing to let it slip. By the time she lit a candle inside the keep, she knew something was wrong. She felt on fire. Her eyes burned, her joints ached. Was she sick? Dear Creator, not now. She needed strength. When she felt the stabbing pain under her breastbone, she crossed an arm across her middle and slumped into a chair. She groaned as the room spun. What was the honey cake? It had never occurred to her that it could come this way. She had been wondering how one could overpower her. She was not without her Han, after all, and it was strong in her, stronger than nearly any other sorceress. How could she be so stupid? She doubled over in the chair with a searing lash of pain. In her wavering vision, she saw two figures enter the room, one short, one taller. Two? She hadn't expected two. Dear Creator, two could ruin everything. Well, well, look what the night netted me. Struggling with the effort, Anne tilted her head up. Who is it? They stepped closer. Don't you remember me? The old woman in the blanket cackled. Don't recognize me, all old and wasted. Well, you're to blame for that. I must say, you look hardly a day older. I could still have my youth were it not for you, my dear, dear prelate. Then you would recognize me. Anne gasped as the twisting pain bore down on her. Honey cake not setting well. Who? The old woman put her hands to her knees and leaned down. Why, prelate, surely you must remember. I promised you that you would pay for what you did to me. And you don't even remember the cruel thing you did? Did it mean that little to you? Anne's eyes widened in sudden recognition. She would never have recognized her after all these years, but the voice, the voice was the same. Valdora, the old woman cackled again. Well, dear prelate, I'm honored you would remember one so lowly as I. She bowed with exaggerated courtesy. I hope you also remember what I promised you. You do remember, don't you? I promised to see you dead. Anne felt herself hit the floor as she writhed in agony. I thought that after you reflected on your actions, you would see the wrong in your ways. I can see now that I was right to put you from the palace. You have no right to serve as a sister. Oh, don't concern yourself, prelate. I've started my own palace. My granddaughter here is my student, my novice. I teach her better than your sisters could ever teach. I teach her everything. You teach her to poison people? Valdora laughed. Oh, the poison won't kill you. Just a little something to incapacitate you until I could bind you up all helpless in a web. You'll not die so easily. She leaned down closer, her voice coming like venom. You are going to be a long time dying, prelate. You may even last all the way to morning. A person can die a thousand times over in a single night. How could you have known I would come? The woman straightened. Oh, I didn't. When I saw the Lord Raal and he gave me one of your coins, I thought he might end up bringing me a sister too. I had no idea, not in my wildest hopes, that he would bring me the prelate herself, delivered right into my hands. My, my, what a marvel. No, I never even dared hope. I would have been more than happy just to skin one of your sisters, or even your student Lord Raal, to do you a pain. But now... I can fulfill my deepest, darkest desires. Anne tried to call her Han. Through the layer of pain, she realized the honey cake had contained more than simple poison. It had been bound up with a spell. Dear Creator, this was not going the way it should. The room was getting dim. She felt a jerk of pain in her scalp. She felt the stone scrape along her back. She saw the pretty, smiling face of the girl walking along at her side. I forgive you, child. Anne whispered, and then the blackness smothered her. Chapter 39 Kalin clutched Addie's arm in one hand and a sword in the other as they ran. In the darkness, they both stumbled over Orsk, falling hard. Kalin yanked her hand back from the warm mass of his guts in the snow. How, how could he be here? Addie panted, trying to catch her breath. 
It'd be impossible. There's enough moon to see. I know we're not going in circles. She took a quick swipe against the snow, smearing the gore from her hands. She scrambled to her feet, pulling Addie up with her. There were bodies clad in red capes scattered all about. They had had only one fight. There couldn't be other bodies. And Orsk? Kaylin swept her gaze along the tree line, looking for the men on horseback. Addie, remember the vision Jebra had? She saw me going in circles. Addie brushed the snow from her face. But how? Kaylin knew Addie couldn't run anymore. She had used her power to fight, and she was near dead with exhaustion. The force of her magic unleashed had been a terror to the attackers, but there were too many. Orsk must have killed 20 or 30 by himself. Kaylin hadn't seen Orsk killed, but she had come across his body three times now. He had been cut nearly in two. Which way do you think we must go to get away? She asked the sorceress. They be back there, Addie pointed. We must go this way. That's what I think, too. She pulled Addie the other way. We've been doing what we think we should, and it's not working. We have to try something else. Come on. We must do what we think is wrong. It could be a spell, Addie offered. If it is, you'll be right. I be too tired to feel it if there be one. They charged through the bramble and down a steep slope, half running, half sliding down the snow. Before she bounded over the edge, she saw the horsemen spring from the cover of trees. The snow at the bottom was drifted into deep banks. They both struggled through them toward trees. It was like trying to run in a quagmire. A man suddenly came out of the night and drove down the slope after them. Kaylin didn't wait for Addie to try to use her magic. There was no time if she failed. Kaylin spun, bringing the sword around. The man in the red cape swept his sword up defensively as he plunged onward. He wore an armored breastplate. Her strike would be wasted on his armor. He was protecting his face, an instinctive reaction, but a fatal move against someone trained by her father, King Wyborn. Men in armor fought with false confidence. With all her strength, Kaylin took her sword low instead. It jolted to a halt when it hit his femur. The man, the muscle of his thigh cleaved, tumbled with a helpless cry to the trampled ground. Another man leapt over top of him, toward her. His red cape sailed open in the night air. Kaylin brought her sword up, slashing the inside of his thigh, severing the artery. As he fell past her, she hacked his hamstring. The first cried out in panic. The second man cursed at the top of his lungs, calling her every vile name she had ever heard as he crawled ahead, brandishing his sword, provoking her to dare to fight him. Kaylin remembered her father's counsel. Words can't cut you. Ward only for steel. Fight only steel. She didn't waste the time to finish them. They would probably bleed to death in the snow. And even if they didn't, maimed as they were, they couldn't come after her. Clutching each other's arms, she and Addie fled onward into the trees. Panting in the darkness, they wove their way through the snow-crusted fir trees. Kaylin realized Addie was shivering. She had lost her heavy cloak at the very beginning. Kaylin pulled off her wolf-hide mantle and threw it around Addie's shoulders. No, child, Addie began to protest. Wear it, Kaylin commanded. I'm sweating, and anyway, it only slows my sword. In truth, her sword arm was so weary she could hardly lift the thing, much less swing it. Only fright powered her muscles. For now, that was enough. Kaylin no longer knew which way she was running. The two of them simply ran for their lives. When she wanted to go right, she went left instead. The trees they ran through were too thick to see the stars or the moon. She had to get away. Richard was in danger. Richard needed her. She had to get to him. Zed should be there by now, but anything could go wrong. Zed might not make it. She had to. Kaylin slapped a balsam branch aside, struggling into a small open area of ledge, windblown nearly clean of snow. She started to a halt. Before her stood two horses. Tobias Brogan, the Lord General of the Blood of the Fold, smiled down at her. A woman in tattered scraps of colored cloth sat on a horse beside him. Brogan knuckled his mustache. And what have we here? Two travelers, Kaelin said, in voice as cold as the winter air. Since when has the blood taken to robbing and butchering helpless travelers? Helpless travelers? Hardly. The two of you must have killed over a hundred of my men. We have been defending our lives from the blood of the fold, which, if it thinks it can get away with it, attacks people it doesn't even know. Oh, I know you, Kaelin Amnel, Queen of Galia. I know more than you think. I know who you be. Kalin's fist tightened on the hilt of the sword. Brogan stepped his big dappled gray closer, a gruesome grin overcoming his face. 
He rested an arm on the pommel as he leaned forward, his dark eyes holding her in their malevolent grip. You, Kaelin Amnell, be the mother confessor. I see you for who you be, and you be the mother confessor. Kaelin's muscles locked tight, her breath held prisoner in her lungs. How could he know that? Had Zed removed the spell? Had something happened to Zed? Dear spirits, if anything happened to Zed... With a cry of rage, she brought the sword around in a mighty swing. At the same time, the woman in the tattered rags flung a hand out. With a grunt of effort, Addie cast out a shield. A blow of air from the woman atop the horse brushed past Kaelin's face, flicking her hair out. Addie's shield had saved her. Kaelin's sword flashed in the moonlight. The night air cracked as her blade sundered the horse's leg under Brogan. The horse screamed as it thudded to the ground, pitching Brogan into the trees. At the same time, a gout of flame from Addie enveloped the other horse's head. It reared wildly, throwing the woman, whom Kaelin now knew to be a sorceress, too. Kaelin snatched Addie's hand and yanked her away. They scrambled desperately into the brush. All around, she could hear men and horses crashing through the trees. Kaelin didn't try to think where she was going. She simply ran. There was one thing she hadn't resorted to yet. She was saving her power as her last recourse. It could only be used once, and then would take hours to recover. Most confessors took a day or two to recover their magic. The fact that Kaelin could recover her power within a couple of hours marked her as one of the most powerful confessors to have ever been born. That power didn't seem like much now. One chance. Addie, Kaelin gasped, trying to catch her breath. If you can, if they catch us, try to slow one of the two women. Addie didn't need further explanation. She understood. Both the women chasing them were sorceresses. If Kaelin had to use her power, that would be the best use of it. Kaelin ducked at a flash of light. A tree beside them crashed down with a deafening roar. As the snow cleared in rolling clouds, the other woman, the one who had been afoot, marched forward. Beside the woman was a dark, scaled creature, looking half man, half lizard. Kaelin heard a cry come from her throat. It felt as if her bones wanted to jump out of her unmoving flesh. I've had quite enough of this nonsense, the woman said as she strode forward, the scaled thing at her side. Mriswith. It had to be Mriswith. Richard had described them to her. This nightmare creature could only be a Mriswith. Addie darted closer, casting sparkling light toward the woman. The woman flicked her hand almost indifferently, and Addie went down, the sparkles settling harmlessly to the snow. The woman bent, took Addie's wrist, and cast her away like a chicken for later plucking. Kaelin burst into action, diving forward with her sword. The thing, the Mriswith, swept before her like a gust of wind. She saw its dark cape billow open as it spun past. She heard the ring of steel. She realized she was on her knees. Her empty sword hand tingled and stung. How could it move that fast? When she looked up, the woman was closer. Her hand came up, and the air shimmered. Kaelin felt a blow to her face. She blinked the blood from her eyes, seeing the woman lift her hand again, her fingers curling. The woman's arm suddenly splayed in the air as if she was hit from behind by a mighty wallop. Addie must have used everything she had left. The invisible blast of magic from Addie, hard as a hammer, threw the woman forward. Kaelin caught her hand as she tried desperately to snatch it back. It was too late. Everything slowed in Kaelin's mind. The sorceress seemed to be suspended in midair. Kaelin gripped her hand. Time was Kaelin's now. She had all the time in the world. The sorceress began to gasp. She began to look up. She began to flinch. In the calm center of her power, her magic, Kaelin was in control. The woman had no chance. As Kaelin watched, she could feel the magic within. The confessor's magic ripped through every fiber of her being, screaming onward. In that timeless place of her mind, Kaelin released her power. Lightning without sound jolted the night. As the concussion slammed through the air, even the stars above seemed to stagger as if a celestial fist had struck the great silent bell of the night sky. The shock shuddered the trees. A cloud of snow lifted, billowing outward in a ring. The impact of magic had knocked the Mriswith from its feet. The woman looked up, her eyes wide, her muscles slack. Mistress, she whispered, command me. Men were crashing through the trees. The Mriswith was staggering to its feet. Protect me. The sorceress sprang up, spinning with a hand out. The night ignited. Lightning ripped through the trees in an arc. Tree trunks exploded as the twisting line of light sliced across them. Splintered wood spun through the air, trailing smoke. 
Men were no less naked before the rending violence than were the trees. Not so much as a scream escaped their lungs, nor would it have been heard above the pandemonium. The Mriswith vaulted toward her, scales like the feathers of a bird hit by a rock from a sling filled the air. The night roared with fire. The air was rife with flame, flesh, and bone. Kaylin wiped blood from her eyes, trying to see as she scooted backward across the snow. She had to get away. She had to find Addie. She bumped into something. She thought it must be a tree. A fist snatched her by the hair. She reached for her power, realizing too late that it was gone. Kaylin spit blood from her mouth. Her ears rang. And then there was pain. She couldn't push herself up. Her head felt as if a tree had fallen on it. She heard a voice above her. Lunetta, put a stop to this at once. Kaylin turned her head in the snow and saw the sorceress she had touched with her power seemed to grow bigger, to come apart. Her arms went in two different directions. That was all Kaylin could recognize as a cloud of red misted the air where the woman had been. Kaylin slumped into the numbing snow. No, she couldn't give up. She twisted up onto her knees, pulling her knife. Brogan's boot caught her in the middle. Looking up at the stars, she tried to draw a breath. She couldn't. Cold panic swept through her as she tried to get air. It wouldn't come. Her stomach muscles clenched in spasms, but she couldn't get a breath. Brogan knelt beside her, pulling her up by her shirt. Breath finally came in convulsing, coughing, choking pulls. At last, he whispered. At last I have the prize of prizes, the keeper's most precious pet, the mother confessor herself. Oh, you have no idea how I've dreamed of this day. He backhanded her across the jaw. No idea at all. Kaylin labored for air as Brogan twisted the knife from her grip. She fought to keep her mind from going black. She had to remain conscious if she was to think, if she was to fight. Lernetta! Yes, my Lord General, I be here. Kaylin felt the buttons on her shirt pop off as he ripped it open. She weakly lifted an arm to check his hands. He batted the arm away. Her arms felt too heavy to lift. First, Lunetta, we must take her before her power returns. Then we will have all the time we want to question her before she pays for her crimes. He leaned closer in the moonlight, leaning a knee into her gut, holding her down. She fought to get air back into her lungs. But then it rushed out with a scream as his brutal fingers wrenched her left nipple. She saw the knife come up in his other hand. With wide eyes, she saw a white glimmer before Brogan's grin. In the moonlight, three blades poised before his bloodless face. Kaylin's eyes, along with Brogan's, turned to see two Mriswith above them. Release her, the Mriswith hissed, or die. Kaylin covered the piercing pain in her breast when he had done as he was told. Her eyes watered with the intensity of hurt. At least it helped clear them of the blood. What be the meaning of this, Brogan growled. She be mine. The creator wishes her punished. You will do as the dream swalker commands, or you will die. Brogan cocked his head. He wishes this? The Mriswith hissed confirmation. I don't understand. You question? No. No, of course not. It will be as you advise, sacred one. Kalin was afraid to sit up, hoping they would tell Brogan to let her go next. Brogan stood, backing away. Another Mriswith appeared with Addie, shoving her to the ground beside Kalin. The sorceress's touch on Kalin's arm said, without word, that she was all right if bruised and cut. Addie put an arm around Kalin's shoulders and helped her sit up. Kalin hurt everywhere. Her jaw throbbed where Brogan had hit her. Her stomach ached and her forehead stung. Blood was still running into her eyes. One of them Mriswith selected two rings from a number looped over its wrist and shoved them at the sorceress in tattered rags. Lunetta, Brogan had called her. The other is dead. You must do it instead. Lunetta, looking puzzled, took the rings. Do what? Use your gift to put these around their neck so they can be controlled. Lunetta pulled, and one of the collars snapped, coming open. She seemed surprised, even pleased. Holding it out, she bent over Addie. Please, sister, Addie whispered in her native tongue. I be from your homeland. Help us. Lunetta paused, looking into Addie's eyes. Lunetta! Brogan kicked her rump. Hurry up, do as the creator wishes. Lunetta snapped the metal collar around Addie's neck, then shuffled over to Kaylin and did the same. 
Kaylin blinked at the childlike smile Lunetta gave her. Kaylin reached up after Lunetta straightened and felt the collar. In the moonlight, she thought she recognized it, but when she felt the smooth metal and could no longer find the seam, she was sure. It was a Radahan, like the Sisters of the Light had put around Richard's neck. She knew that those sorceresses used the collar to control him. The purpose must be the same for them, to control their power. Kaylin suddenly feared that her power would not be returning in a few hours. When they reached the coach, Ahern was there at the point of a Mriswith blade. He had told Kaylin, Addie, and Orsk to dive out of the coach on a curve, and he would lead their pursuers away from her. A bold and brave move that in the end had failed. Kaylin was suddenly relieved she had made everyone else go to Ebenissia as planned. Kaylin had told Jebra to care for Cyrilla and the rest of the men to carry out their plans to bring Ebenissia back from the ashes. Kaylin's sister was home. If Kaylin died, Galia still had a queen. Had she brought any of those gallant young men, these Mriswith, these nightmare creatures of the wind, would have gutted them all, as they had done to Orsk. She felt a pang of sorrow for Orsk, and then a claw shoved her into the coach. Addie was pushed in right behind her. Kaylin heard a brief conversation, and then Lunetta climbed in the coach, sitting across from Kaylin and Addie. A Mriswith entered and sat beside Lunetta, its beady eyes taking account of them. Kaylin pulled her shirt closed and tried to wipe the blood from her eyes. She heard more talking outside, something about replacing the runners on the coach with wheels. Through the window, she saw Ahern at sword point climb up to the driver's seat. The man in the red cape followed him up, and then another of the Mriswith. Kaylin felt her legs trembling. Where were they taking them? She was so close to Richard. She clenched her teeth, holding back a wail. It wasn't fair. She felt a tear roll down her cheek. Addie's hand slid between their legs, and by its little movement against her thigh, she read the comfort in that touch. The Mriswith leaned forward as its slit of a mouth seemed to widen in a grim smile. It lifted the three-bladed knife in its claw, giving it a little wiggle before their eyes. Try to escape, and I will slice the bottoms of your feet. It cocked its smooth head. Understand. Kalen and Addie both nodded. Speak, it added, and I will slice out your tongues. They nodded again. It turned to Lunetta. With your gift through the collar, seal their power like I show you. It put a claw to Lunetta's forehead. Understand. Lunetta smiled with comprehension. Yes, I see. Kaylin heard Addie grunt, and at the same time she felt something tighten in her own chest. It was the place where she always felt her power. In dismay, she wondered if she would ever feel it return. She remembered the forlorn emptiness when the Keltish wizard had used magic to make her lose the connection with her power. She knew what to expect. She bleeds, the Mriswith said to Lunetta. You must heal her. Skin Brother would not be pleased if she were scarred. She heard the whip snap and Ahern's whistle. The coach lurched ahead. Lunetta leaned forward to heal her wound. Dear spirits, where were they taking her? Chapter 40 Anne's eyes stung with tears as a shuddering cry escaped her throat. She had long ago forsaken her determination to keep from crying out. Who but the Creator would hear or care? Valdora lifted the knife, greasy with blood. Hat? A gap-toothed grin came to her as a chuckle fought its way out. How do you like it when someone else chooses what will happen to you? That's what you did. You chose how I would die. You denied me life. Life I could have had at the palace. I would still be young. You chose to let me die. Anne flinched as the knife point pricked her side. I asked a question, prelate. How do you like it? No more than you, I would expect. The grin returned. Good. I want you to know the pain I've lived with all these years. I left you with a life the same as everyone else has, a life to live as you would. You were left with what the Creator gave you, the same as everyone else come into this world. I could have had you executed. For casting a spell? I'm a sorceress. That's what the Creator gave me, and I used it. Though Anne knew the arguments were pointless, she favored them over Valdora going back to her silent knife work. You used what the Creator gave you to take from others what they would not have given willingly. You thieved their affections, their hearts, their lives. 
You had no right. You sampled devotion like candies at a fair. You bound them to you with glamours and then cast them away to snare another. The knife pricked her again. And you banished me. How many lives did you bring to ruin? You were counseled, you were warned, you were punished. Still, you continued. Only after all this were you put out of the palace of the prophets. Anne's shoulders throbbed with a dull ache. She was stretched out naked on a wooden table, her wrists bound with magic over her head at one end and her ankles at the other. The spell chafed worse than coarse hemp rope. She was as helpless as a hog hung up to be bled. Valdora had used a spell, something else she had learned who knew where, to block Anne's Han. She could feel it there, like a warm fire on a winter's night, just beyond a window, inviting, promising warmth, but out of reach. Anne stared up at the window near the top of the wall in the little stone room. It was nearing daylight. Why hadn't he come? He should have come to rescue her by now. And then she was to somehow capture him. But he hadn't come. It still wasn't daylight. He still might come. Dear Creator, let him come soon. Unless it was the wrong day. Panic raced through her mind. What if they had miscalculated? No. She and Nathan had gone over the charts. This was the right day. And besides, it was the events more than the day itself that fueled the prophecy. The fact that she had been captured said that it was the right day. If she had been captured a week before, then that would have been the right day. This day was within the window of opportunity. The prophecy was being fulfilled. But where was he? Anne realized that Valdora's face was gone. She wasn't beside her. She should have kept talking. She should... She felt a sudden, sharp, searing pain as the knife cut down the sole of her left foot. Her whole body jerked against the restraints. Sweat once again beaded on her brow and trickled through her scalp. Again the pain came, another cut, accompanied by another impotent cry. Her screams reverberated from the stone as Valdora ripped a strip of flesh from the sole of her foot. She was shaking uncontrollably. Her head lolled to the side. The little girl, Holly, was looking into her eyes. Anne felt tears run over the bridge of her nose and into her other eye to finally fall away. Trembling, she stared into Holly's eyes, wondering what vile things Valdora was teaching such an innocent child. She would turn this small creature's heart to stone. Valdora held up the little white curl of flesh. Look, Holly, how cleanly it comes off if you do as I say. Would you like to try your hand, my dear? Grandmama, Holly said, must we do this? She has done nothing to harm us. She is not like the others. She never tried to hurt us. Valdora gestured with the knife for emphasis. Oh, but she has, dear one. She hurt me. She stole my youth. Holly glanced at Anne as she shivered with the lingering pain. The little girl had an odd mask of calm for one so young. She would have made an outstanding novice and one day a fine sister. She gave me a silver. She didn't try to hurt us. This is not fun. I don't want to do it. Valdora chuckled. Well, do it we will. She wiggled the knife. You listen to your grandmama. She deserves it. Holly coolly considered the old woman. Just because you're older than me, that doesn't make you right. I'll watch no longer. I'm going outside. Valdora shrugged. If you wish. This is between the prelate and me. If you do not wish to learn anything, then go outside and play. Holly strode from the room. Anne could have kissed her for her courage. Valdora's face glided closer. Just you and me now, prelate. Her jaw muscles flexed. Shall we get... She jabbed the knife point into Anne's side to punctuate each word. Down to business. She tilted her head to better look into Anne's eyes. Near time to die, prelate. I think I'd like to see you scream to death. Shall we try... Over there, Zed tried to point as best he could, confined as he was. There's a light in the keep. Though dawn was beginning to lighten the sky, it was still dark enough to pick out the yellow glow coming from several windows. Gratch saw what Zed was seeing and banked toward the keep. Bags, he muttered. If that boy is already in the keep, I'll... Gratch growled at Zed's obvious reference to Richard. He could feel the growl against his back pressed to the gar's chest more than he could hear it. Zed glanced to the ground far below. I'll have to save him, that's all I meant, Gratch. If Richard is in trouble, I'll have to get down there to save him. Gratch gurgled with satisfaction. 
Zed hoped Richard wasn't in trouble. The effort of maintaining the spell to make himself light enough for Gratch to carry him for the last week had sapped nearly all his strength. He didn't think he would be able to stand, much less use his power to save anyone. He would need days of rest after this. Zed stroked the huge furry arms around him. I love Richard too, Gratch. We'll help him. Both of us will protect him. Zed's eyes widened. Gratch! Watch where you're going! Slow down! Zed held his arms up before his face as the gar swooped down toward the rampart. Peeking between his arms, he could see the stone approach at alarming speed. He gasped as Gratch tightened his grip and flapped his wings, trying to halt their plummeting descent. Zed realized he was losing his grip on his spell. He was too exhausted to hold on any longer, and he was becoming too heavy for Gratch to carry. In desperation, he drew the spell back, like catching an egg rolling from the edge of a table. Just in time, he snatched the spell before it winked out and yanked it back. Gratch's flapping finally netted enough air to slow them, and he pulled up before they hit. With a graceful flutter of his huge leathery wings, the gar set them on the rampart. Zed felt the furry arms come off his sweat-soaked robes. Sorry, Gratch, I almost lost my grip on the magic. I almost got us both hurt. Gratch absently grunted acknowledgement. His glowing green eyes were searching the darkness. There were walls going everywhere up here, and a hundred places to hide. Gratch seemed to be searching them all. A low growl rumbled in the gar's throat. The green glow intensified. Zed searched the dark recesses, but saw nothing. Gratch did. Zed flinched when, with a sudden roar, the gar bounded into the darkness. Massive claws ripped at the night air. Fangs tore at nothing. Zed began to see shapes seeming to come out of the air. Capes billowed open, and knives flashed as the things danced and spun around the gar. Mriswith. The creatures let out clicking hisses as they lunged at the great fur beast. Gratch caught them on claws, ripping their scaled hides open, spilling their blood and insides. Their howls as they died drew a shiver up Zed's spine. Zed felt the air move as one swept past, intent on the gar. The wizard threw his hand out, casting a ball of liquid fire that caught the Mriswith, igniting its cape, and then spilled flame over the rest of it. The rampart was suddenly alive with the creatures. Zed, digging deep to bring up the power, snapped back a line of dense air, throwing several over the edge. Gratch threw one at the wall with such violence that it burst open when it hit. Zed wasn't prepared for the pitched battle that was suddenly all around him. Through his numb exhaustion, Zed's frenetic quest for ideas couldn't engender anything more ingenious than simple magic of fire and air. Amriswith turned suddenly, bringing around its bladed claw. Zed threw a line of air as sharp as an axe. It cleaved the Mriswith's head. He used a web to snare several away from Gratch and cast them over the side of the wall. At this outer rampart, it was a drop of several thousand feet straight down. The Mriswith, for the most part, ignored Zed, so resolute were they with taking down the Gar. Why did they want so badly to hurt the Gar? By the way Gratch was dispatching them, it seemed they held a primal hatred for the winged beast. A wedge of light suddenly stabbed through the pre-dawn darkness as a door opened. A small figure stood silhouetted in the light. In the illumination, Zed could see the Mriswith all lunging for the gar. He rushed forward, throwing a fist of fire that engulfed three of the scaled creatures, spinning forward with their knives flashing. A Mriswith hurtled past, slamming Zed's shoulder, knocking him from his feet. He saw the Mriswith pile into the gar, knocking him back against the crenellated wall. Zed saw them all, in one seething mass, tumble over the edge and fall into the night just as his head hit the stone. The door squeaked open. As Valdora rose from her work, Anne gasped to catch her breath and at the same time fought the darkness, trying to shroud her mind. She couldn't do it any longer. She was at the end. She had no more screams left. Dear Creator, she could not hold out any longer. Why hadn't he come to rescue her? Grandmama! Holly grunted with effort as she labored to drag something inch by inch into the room. Grandmama, something has happened! Valdora turned to the girl. Where did you find him? Anne struggled to lift her head. Holly huffed and strained to lift a skinny old man up by his maroon robes and lean him against the wall. Blood trickled down the side of his head and matted his wavy white hair sticking out in disarray. He's a wizard, Grandmama. He's near to dead, 
I saw him having a fight with a gar and some other creatures all covered with scales. What makes you think he's a wizard? Holly straightened, panting as she stood over the old man on the floor. He was using his gift. He was casting balls of fire. Valdora frowned. Really? A wizard? How interesting. She scratched her nose. What happened to the creatures in the gar? Holly wheeled her arms about as she described the battle. And then they all jumped on the gar, and all of them fell over the side. I went to the edge and looked, but I couldn't see them anymore. They all fell down the mountain. Anne's head thumped back to the table. Dear Creator, it was a wizard who was supposed to rescue her. It was all for naught. She was going to die. How could she have been so vain as to believe she could do something this risky and get away with it? Nathan was right. Nathan. She wondered if he would ever find her body to know what had happened, or would even care if his warden was dead. She was a foolish, foolish old woman who thought herself more clever than she was. She had tampered with prophecy one time too many, and it had bitten her. Nathan was right. She should have listened. Anne flinched when she saw Valdora leaning over her with a wicked grin. She pushed the knife point up under Anne's chin. Well, dear prelate, it seems I have a wizard to dispatch. She drew the knife point across Anne's throat. She could feel it tugging at the skin, cutting and scratching as it dragged along. Please, Valdora, ask Holly to leave the room. You shouldn't let your granddaughter see you kill someone. Valdora turned. You'd like to watch, wouldn't you, dear? Holly swallowed. No, Grandmama, she never tried to hurt us. I've told you, she hurt me, Holly pointed. I brought him in here so you could help him. Oh, no, can't have that. He must die, too. And what did he do to hurt you? Valdora shrugged. If you don't want to watch, then go. It won't hurt my feelings. Holly turned, pausing a moment to glance down at the old man. She reached out and touched his shoulder in a comforting way, and then hurried away. Valdora turned back. She laid the knife against Anne's cheek under her eye. Should I gouge out your eyes first? Anne closed her eyes, unable to witness the terror any longer. No! Valdora jabbed the point under her chin. Don't close your eyes! You will watch! If you don't open them, I will gouge them out then. Anne opened her eyes. She held her lower lip between her teeth as she watched Valdora put the point to her chest and lift the handle straight up. At last, Valdora whispered. Vengeance. She lifted the knife. It paused in midair as she pulled a deep breath. Valdora's body twitched as a sword blade erupted from the center of her chest. Her eyes widened and she let out a gurgling squeal as the knife dropped to the floor. Nathan put a foot to Valdora's back and drew the sword out of the woman. She went down hard to the stone floor. Anne let out a wail of relief. Tears streamed from her eyes as the bonds holding her wrists and ankles broke. Nathan, tall and grim, gazed down at her lying on the table. You foolish woman, he whispered. What have you let be done to you? He bent and took her up in his arms as she wept like a child. His arms felt as sweet as the creator's as he held her to his breast. As her crying slowed, he parted from her, and she saw that the front of him was soaked with blood. Her blood. Remove the block, and then lie back, and let me see if I can possibly heal this mess. Anne pushed his hand away. No, first I must do what I came to do. She pointed. It is he, the wizard we've come for. Can't it wait? She wiped blood and tears from her eyes. Nathan, I have gone through this dreadful prophecy this far. Let me finish, please. With a disgusted sigh, he reached in a pouch beside his scabbard at his belt and pulled out a radahan. He handed it over as she slid off the table. When her feet touched the floor, the pain crumpled her. Nathan caught her with a big arm and helped her to kneel before the unconscious wizard. Help me, Nathan. Open it for me. She broke most of my fingers. With trembling hands, she placed the collar around the wizard's neck. Pushing with her palms, she at last managed to snap it shut, locking on not only the collar, but its magic. The prophecy was fulfilled. Holly stood in the doorway. Is Grandmama dead? Anne sagged back on her heels. Yes, my dear child, I'm sorry. She held out a hand. How would you like to watch a healing instead of a hurting? Holly gently took the hand. 
She glanced to the wizard on the floor. And him? Will you heal him too? Yes, Holly, him too. That was why I brought him in, to be helped, not to be killed. Grandmama helped people sometimes. She wasn't always mean. I know, Anne said. A tear rolled down the girl's cheek. What is to become of me now? She whispered. Anne smiled through the tears. I am Annalena Alduran, prelate of the Sisters of the Light, and have been for a good long time. I've taken in many young women with the gift like you, and have taught them to be wonderful women who heal and help people. I would be most happy if you would come with us. Holly nodded, a smile coming to her tear-stained face. Grandmama took care of me, but she was mean to other people sometimes, mostly those who would try to hurt us or cheat us, but you never did. It was wrong for her to hurt you. I'm sorry she wasn't nicer. I'm sorry she had to be mean and die. Anne kissed the girl's hand. Me too. Me too. I have the gift. She looked up with big, doleful eyes. Can you teach me to heal with it? It would be my honor. Nathan picked up his sword and with a dramatic flourish slid it back into its scabbard. You want to be healed now? Or would you prefer to bleed to death so I can try my hand at resurrection? Anne winced as she came to her feet. Heal me, my savior, he squinted. Then allow me access to my power, woman. I can't heal with my sword. Anne closed her eyes as she lifted a hand, focusing her inner sense on his Radha Han, removing the block in the flow of his Han. It is done. Nathan grunted. I know it's done. I can feel it back, you know. Help me onto the table, Nathan. Holly held her hand as she was lifted up. Nathan peered down at the wizard on the floor. Well, you've finally got him. Far as I know, one such as he has never been colored before. His penetrating blue eyes turned to her. Now that you've got a wizard of the First Order, the true madness of this whole plan of yours begins. Anne sighed as his healing hands at last caressed her. I know. Hopefully, Verna has her end of matters well in hand by now. Chapter 41 Zed gasped as his eyes popped open. He sat bolt upright. A big hand on his chest pushed him back down. Take it easy, old man, a deep voice said. Zed goggled up at the square-jawed face. His shoulder-length white hair fell forward as he leaned over, putting both hands to the sides of Zed's head. Who are you calling old, old man? The penetrating blue eyes beneath an intimidating raptor's brow smiled along with the rest of his face. It was a mixed visage Zed found unsettling. Now that you mention it, I guess I am a bit older than you. There was something familiar about that face. It came to him in a rush. Zed shoved the hands away and sat up, pointing a bony finger at the tall man beside the table. You look like Richard. Why do you look like Richard? His cheeks drew back with a wide smile. The brow was still looking very hawk-like. He's a relative of mine. Relative? Bags! Zed peered closer. Tall, muscular, blue eyes. Hair looks of similar texture. That jaw. Worse, the eyes. Zed folded his arms. You're a Rawl, he pronounced. Very good. You know Richard, then. Know him. I'm his grandfather. His brow elevated. Grandfather. He wiped his face with one of his big hands. Dear creator, he muttered, what has that woman gotten us into? Woman? What woman? With a sigh, he took the hand away from his face. The smile returned, and he bowed. A rather good bow, Zed thought. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Nathan Rawl. He straightened. And may I have your name, friend? Friend? Nathan rapped his knuckles on Zed's forehead. I just healed your cracked skull. That should count for something. Well, Zed grumbled. Perhaps you're right. Thank you, Nathan. I'm Zed. A talented bit of healing if my skull really was cracked. Oh, it was. I seem to get quite a bit of practice. How do you feel? Zed took stock of himself. Well, fine. I feel fine. My strength is back. He groaned, remembering what had happened. Gratch. Dear spirits, I have to get out of here. Nathan planted a restraining hand on Zed's chest. We have to have a little talk, friend. At least I hope we can become friends. We unfortunately have a lot in common besides being related to Richard. Zed blinked up at the tall man. Like what? Nathan unbuttoned his ruffled shirt at the top. 
The whole front of him was covered with dried blood. Nathan hooked a finger through a dull silver collar around his neck and lifted it a bit. Zed's voice lowered to a somber timbre. Is that what I think it is? You're a pretty smart fellow, I've no doubt, or you wouldn't be of such value. Zed returned his gaze to the blue eyes. And what unfortunate thing do we have in common? Nathan reached out and tugged something at Zed's neck. Zed's hands shot up to feel the smooth metal collar. He could find no seam. What is the meaning of this? Why would you do this? Nathan heaved a sigh. Not me, Zed, he pointed. Her. A squat old woman with gray hair tied in a loose knot at the back of her head was walking through the doorway. She held the hand of a little girl. Ah, she said, as her fingers touched the top of the dark brown dress buttoned to her throat. I see Nathan has you back to right. I'm so pleased. We were worried. Is that so? Zed said noncommittally. The old woman smiled. Yes. She looked at the little girl, stroking her straight light brown hair. This is Holly. She dragged you in here. She saved your life. I seem to remember seeing her. Thank you for your help, Holly. You have my gratitude. I'm so glad you're healed, the girl said. I was afraid that Gar might have killed you. Gar? Did you see him? Is he all right? She shook her head. He went over the wall with all those monsters. Bags, said whispered through his teeth. That Gar was a friend. The woman lifted an eyebrow. A Gar? Well, I'm sorry then. Zed turned his glare on the woman. What is this collar doing around my neck? She spread her hands. I'm sorry, but it is necessary for now. You will remove it. Her smile stayed where it was. I understand your concern, but it must remain in place for now. She folded her hands at her waist. I'm afraid I haven't been introduced. What is your name? Zed's voice came low and dangerous. I am First Wizard Zedicus Zool Zaranda. I'm Annalena Aldurin, prelate of the Sisters of the Light. Her smile warmed. You may call me Anne. All my friends do, Zed. With his eyes locked on the woman, Zed hopped off the table. You are not my friend. She took a step back. You will address me as Wizard Zaranda. Easy, friend, Nathan cautioned. Zed turned a glare on him that closed his mouth and straightened his spine. She shrugged. As you wish, Wizard Zaranda. Zed tapped the collar at his neck. Remove this at once. Her smile clung tenaciously to her face. It must remain. Zed began closing the distance between them. Nathan strode forward, apparently to restrain him. Without turning his eyes from the prelate, Zed lifted an arm, pointing a thin finger toward Nathan. The big man, his arms flailing, slid backward, as if he were standing on ice in a gale, until he was flattened against the far wall. Zed lifted his other hand, and the ceiling lit, glowing with bluish light. As his hand lowered, a razor-thin plane of light, like the surface of a still lake, lowered, passing over them. Anne's eyes widened. The plane of light descended until it settled on the floor, turning it to a churning layer of boiling light. The light coalesced into points of brilliant intensity. From the points, lightning erupted. Crackling cords of white fire climbed the walls all around, filling the room with a pungent smell. Zed circled a finger, and the lightning leapt from the wall to his collar. Flashes struck out at the metal. The room shook in sympathy with the dancing thunder. Stone dust filled the air. The table lifted and then exploded in a cloud of dust that was sucked into the streams of twisting light. The room quaked and groaned as huge blocks of stone loosened and began chattering out of their place in the wall. Through the fury of power, Zed realized it wasn't working. The collar absorbed the violence without breaking. He whipped an arm out, cutting the cacophony and light. The room rang in sudden silence. Enormous stone blocks hung halfway from the wall. The entire floor was charred and black, yet none of them were burned. Through his analysis of the prelate, the girl, and Nathan via the light bond, he now knew the exact extent of the power of each, their strengths and weaknesses. She could not have made the collar. It had been made by wizards but she could use it. Are you quite through? Anne asked. Her smile was finally gone. I have not yet begun. Zed lifted his arms. He would channel enough power to level a mountain if he had to. Nothing happened. That will be enough, she said. 
Some of her smile returned. I can see where Richard gets some of his fury. Zed thrust out a finger. You! You're the one who collared him! I could have taken him when he was a child, instead of letting him grow up with your love and guidance. Zed could count on the fingers of one hand the times in his life he had truly lost control of his temper, and worse, his reason. He was rapidly approaching the need to start counting on his other hand. Don't try to placate me with your self-righteous justifications. There can be none for slavery, Anne sighed. A prelate like a wizard must sometimes use people. I'm sure you understand that. I regret having had to use Richard, and that I must use you, but I have no choice. A wistful smile passed across her face. Richard was a handful in a color. If you think Richard was trouble, you have seen nothing yet. Wait until you find out the trouble his grandfather will bring down on you. Zed ground his teeth. You put one of your collars around his neck. You abducted boys from the Midlands. You have broken the truce that has stood for thousands of years. You know the consequences of such a transgression. The Sisters of the Light will pay the price. Zed was standing at the brink of the abyss, at the brink of violating the wizard's third rule, yet he couldn't bring his reason under control. That, in fact, was the only way to violate the third rule. I know the consequences of the Imperial Order taking the world. I know you don't understand right now, Wizard Zerander, but I hope you will come to see that we fight on the same side. I understand a lot more than you think I do. You are aiding the Order through this. I've never had to make my allies prisoners to fight for what's right. Really? What would you call the Sword of Truth? Seething, he refused to argue with the woman. You will remove this collar. Richard needs my help. Richard will have to take care of himself. He's a smart boy. You are partly responsible for that. That's why I let him grow up with you. The boy needs my help. He needs to know how to use his power. If I don't get to him, he could come up into the keep. He doesn't know the dangers here. He doesn't know how to use his gift. He could be killed. I can't let that happen. We need him. Richard has already been up to the keep. He spent most of yesterday there, and he left unharmed. Once lucky, Zed quoted, twice confident, and thrice dead. Have faith in your grandson. We must help him in other ways. There is no time to waste. We must be going. I'm not going anywhere with you. Wizard Zerander, I'm asking you to help. I'm asking you to cooperate and come with us. Much is at stake. Please do as I ask, or I will be forced to use the collar. You would not like that. Listen to her, Zed, Nathan said. I can testify that you won't like it. You don't have a choice. I understand how you feel, but it will be easier if you just do as she asks. What manner of wizard are you? Nathan stood a bit taller. I'm a prophet. At least the man was honest. He hadn't recognized the light bond for what it was and didn't know what Zed could read from it. And are you happy about being held in slavery? Anne laughed aloud. Nathan didn't. His eyes betrayed the composed, simmering, deadly fury of a Rawl. I assure you, sir, it is not by my choice. I've been railing against it most of my life. She may know how to subjugate a wizard who is a prophet, but she is going to find out just why I hold the rank of first wizard. I earned the rank in the last war. Both sides in that war called me the Wind of Death. It had been one of the fingers he counted. Turning away from Nathan, Zed fixed the prelate with a look of such cold menace that she swallowed as she retreated a step. By breaking the truce, you have condemned any sister caught in the Midlands to death. By the terms of the truce, they have just been sentenced. Each of you has lost the right to trial or mercy. Any of you caught will be executed on sight without prejudice. Zed thrust his fists into the air. Lightning laced from the clear sky, hammering the keep above them. A deafening howl rose, and a ring of light expanded outward, racing through the sky, leaving a trail of clouds like smoke from flame. The truce is ended. You now stand in enemy territory and upwind of death. If you take me away by this color, I promise you that I will go to your homeland and lay waste to the palace of the prophets. 
Stone-faced, prelate Annalena Aldurin regarded him silently for a moment. Don't make promises that you can't keep. Try me. A distant smile touched her lips. We really must be going. With a grim glare, Zed nodded. So be it. Verna only incrementally became aware that she was awake. It was as dark with her eyes open as with them closed. She blinked, trying to ascertain if she really was conscious. Deciding that she really was awake, she called her Han in order to light a flame. It wouldn't come. She sank deeper into herself and pulled more power. Straining with all her might, she at last managed to light a small flame in her palm. There was a candle on the floor beside the pallet where she sat. She sent the flame into the candle wick, sagging with relief that she could see at last without the monumental effort required to hold forth a flame with her Han. The room was bare except for the pallet, the candle, a small tray with bread and a tin cup of water, and what looked to be a chamber pot against the far, plastered wall. Not too far. The room was not very big. There were no windows, only a heavy wooden door. Verna recognized the room. It was one of the rooms in the infirmary. What was she doing in the infirmary? Looking down, she realized she was naked. She turned to the side and saw her clothes in a pile. When she turned, she felt something at her throat. Reaching up tentatively, she groped at her neck. A Radahan. Her flesh went a tingle. Dear Creator, she had a Radahan around her neck. Panic washed through her in a dizzying rush. She clawed at her neck, trying to get it off. She heard a cry coming from her own throat as she whimpered in terror while yanking frantically at the unyielding ring of metal. In horror, she realized what the boys felt to have this instrument of domination bound to them. How many times had she herself used a collar to make someone do as she wished? But only to help them. Only in their best interest. Only to help them. Did they feel this same helpless dread? She remembered with shame using the collar on Warren. Dear Creator, forgive me, she cried. I only wanted to do your work. Sniffling back the tears, she brought herself back under control. She had to figure out what was happening. She knew that this collar wasn't around her neck to help her. It was to control her. Verna fumbled at her hand. The prelate's ring was gone. Her heart sank. She had failed in her guardianship. She kissed the naked finger, beseeching strength. She pounded her fist against the door when the handle produced no movement. She summoned all her power, focusing it on the handle, trying to make the lever lift. It wouldn't budge. She lashed out at the hinges she knew to be on the other side. Furiously, she concentrated, applying her hand to the task. Tongues of light, green with mental bile, lashed at the door, licked through the cracks and flickered under the gap at the bottom. Verna cut the impotent flow of Han, remembering seeing Sister Simona trying the very same thing hour after hour, with the same ineffectual results. The shield on the door couldn't be broken by one in Arata Han. She knew better than to waste her strength on useless effort. Simona might be crazy, but she was not. Verna slumped back down on the pallet. Her fists pounding against the door would not get her out. Her gift would not get her out. She was trapped. Why was she here? She looked down at her finger where the prelate's ring belonged. That was why. With a gasp, she remembered the real prelate. Anne had given her a mission and was depending on her to get the Sisters of the Light away before Jagang arrived. She dove for her clothes, searching frantically through them. Her dakra was gone. That was probably why they had stripped her, to make sure she had no weapon. That was what had been done to Sister Simona for her own protection, to be sure she wouldn't hurt herself. They couldn't let a crazy woman have a deadly weapon. Her fingers found her belt. She yanked it from the pile of clothes and fumbling along its length found the bulge in the thickness of leather. Trembling with hope, Verna held the belt near the candle. She pulled open the false seam. There, nestled inside the secret pocket, was the journey book. She clutched the belt to her breast, thanking the creator, as she rocked on the pallet, holding her belt tight to her. She had at least this much. When she had finally calmed, she pulled her clothes close to the weak light and dressed, feeling better at least not to be naked and helpless. She was no less helpless, but at least she didn't have to suffer the indignation of being a naked prisoner. She was beginning to feel the least little bit better. Verna didn't know how long she had been unconscious, but she realized she was ravenous. She devoured the crust of bread and gulped down the water. 
After her belly was at least partially satisfied, she turned her thoughts to how she had come to be in this room. Sister Leoma. She remembered Sister Leoma and three others waiting for her in her office. Sister Leoma was high up on her list of suspected Sisters of the Dark. Though she hadn't been put to a test, she had been a part of putting Verna in here. That was proof enough. It had been dark and she hadn't seen the other three, but she had a list of suspects in her head. Phoebe and Dulcinea had let them in, against her orders. However reluctantly, they had to be placed on the list too. Verna started pacing the small room. She was beginning to get angry. How dare they think they could get away with this? They had gotten away with it. A scowl settled in. No, they hadn't. Anne had given her this responsibility and she would live up to that faith. She would get the Sisters of the Light away from the palace. Verna touched her fingers to her belt. She should send a message. Dare she, in here? What if she were caught? It could ruin everything. But she had to let Anne know what had happened. Her pacing halted abruptly. How was she going to tell Anne that she had failed, and that because of her, all the Sisters of the Light were in mortal danger, and she had no way to do anything about it? Jagang was coming. She had to escape. With her in this prison, none of the sisters would know to escape, and Jagang was going to have them all. Richard leaped from the horse as it skidded to a halt. He glanced down the road and saw the others far below galloping to catch him. He rubbed the horse's nose and then started to tie the reins to an iron lever on the drop gate mechanism. He glanced over the gears and levers and then tied the reins to the end of a gear shaft instead. The place he had at first started tying the reins was the release lever to the huge gate. A good yank and the portcullis could come crashing down on the horse. Without waiting for the others, Richard started into the wizard's keep. He was furious that no one had awakened him. A light is burning in the windows of the keep for half the night, he thought, and no one has the nerve to wake the Lord Rahl and tell him. And then, not an hour before, he had seen the lightning and the bloom of light racing outward in an expanding ring through a clear sky, leaving in its wake a smoky layer of clouds. A thought coming to him, Richard paused before he went into the keep and turned to look down on the city. At the bottom of the keep road, other roads branched off leading away from Aden Drill. What if someone had been in the keep? What if they had taken something? He had better tell the soldiers to hold anyone trying to leave. As soon as the others reached the keep, he would send one back down to tell the soldiers to bring back anyone leaving and to seal the roads. Richard watched the people on the road. Most were coming into the city, not leaving. There were a few leaving, though. Would look to be a few families with handcarts, some soldiers going out on patrol, a couple of wagons with trade goods, and four horses close together trotting past the people on foot. He would have them all stopped and checked. But checked for what? He could take a look at the people himself, after the soldiers brought them back, and maybe tell if they carried anything magic. Richard turned back toward the keep. He didn't have the time. He needed to find out what had been going on up here, and besides, how would he know if it were a thing of magic? It would be a waste of time better spent. He needed to get to work with Berdine and translate the journal, not paw through family's belongings. People were still leaving, not wanting to live under Daharan rule. Let them. He marched through the shields inside, knowing that the others would be blocked when they arrived. The five of them would be upset he hadn't waited for them. Well, maybe the next time they would wake him if they saw lights in the keep. Shrouded in his Mriswith cape, he made his way upward toward where he had seen the lightning hit the keep. He avoided passageways that he could sense were dangerous and found other routes that at least didn't raise the hair at the back of his neck. Several times he sensed Mriswith, but they didn't come near. In a wide room with four corridors leading from it, Richard stopped. Several doors stood closed. One had a trail of blood leading to it. He squatted and inspected the smeared trail of blood and determined that it was actually two trails, one leading into the room and one leading out. Richard flung open the Mriswith cape and drew his sword. The clear ring of steel echoed down the corridors. With the point of the blade, he pushed the door open. The room was empty, but it was far from ordinary. The wood floor was scorched. Sooty, jagged lines were seared into the stone as if an enraged lightning storm had been trapped in the room. Most puzzling, though, was the stone block of the walls. 
Here and there, huge blocks of stone hung halfway from the wall, as if they had come near to toppling out of their place. The room looked like it had nearly come apart in an earthquake. There were blood splatters all over the floor, and to the side a big pool of it, but because of the fire that had blackened the floor, it was all dry as dust and told him little. Richard followed the trail of blood from the room until it led to a door to the outer rampart. He stepped out into the cold air and immediately saw the splashes of blood spilled across the stone. It was recent, within the last day. Mriswith and parts of Mriswith littered the wind-swept rampart. Even though they were frozen now, they still stank. Against one wall a good five feet up was a huge splat of blood, and below it, on the ground, a dead Mriswith, its scaled hide, burst open. If the spray of blood had been on the ground instead of the wall, Richard would have thought it had fallen from the sky and been killed from the impact. His eyes gliding over the mess, Richard thought it looked like what was left when Gratch fought Mriswith. He shook his head in dismay, wondering what had happened. He followed a trail of blood to a notch in the crenellated wall and found blood staining the stone to each side. He stepped into the notch and peered over the edge. It was a dizzying sight. The stone blocks of the keep plunged nearly vertically, flaring slightly toward their foundation far below, and beneath that the stone of the mountain itself fell away for what looked to be several thousand feet. From the notch in the wall, a trail of blood ran down the face, disappearing into the distance below. There were several big splotches in the bloody trail. Something had gone over the edge, smacking the wall on the way down. He would have to send soldiers out to see what or who had gone over the edge. He ran a finger through different trails of blood at the edge. Most of it reeked of Mriswith. Some did not. Dear spirits, what had happened up here? Richard pressed his lips together as he shook his head. He drew the black Mriswith cape around himself and vanished as he pondered, thinking too for some reason about Zed. He wished Zed were here with him. Chapter 42 this time, when Verna saw the little flap open at the bottom of the door, she was ready. She dove toward it, shoving the tray aside and putting her face against the floor, trying to see out. Who's out there? Who is it? What's going on? Why am I being held here? Answer my questions! She could see a woman's boots and the hem of a dress, probably a sister who cared for those in the infirmary. The woman straightened. Please, I need another candle. This one's almost gone. She could hear the disinterested footfalls vanish back up the hall, and then the sound of the door and the big bolt being dropped into place as she ground her teeth and pounded her fist on the floor. Verna finally slumped down on the pallet, comforting her hand. She had been pounding the door too often of late. Her frustration was overcoming her sense, she knew. In the windowless room, she had no idea anymore if it was day or night. She assumed that they brought her food in the day, and so tried to keep track of time in that way. But sometimes it seemed they brought food only hours apart, and other times she was nearly starved to death before they brought it. She sorely wished they would do something about the chamber pot. They didn't bring her enough food either. Her dress was getting quite loose at the hips and bust. She had wished for the last several years that she could be a bit smaller, as she had been before she went on her journey twenty years before. She had been thought attractive in her youth, her extra weight always seemed a reminder of that lost youth and beauty. She laughed maniacally. Maybe they thought so too and had decided to put the prelate on a fast. Her laughter died. She had wished Jedediah would see what was on the inside instead of just the outside. And here she was longing for the outside, just as he did. A tear rolled down her cheek. Warren had never ignored what was inside. She was a fool. I pray you are safe, Warren she whispered to the walls. Verna slid the tray across the floor toward the candle. She flopped down and snatched up the tin cup of water. Before she gulped it down, she stopped, cautioning herself to make it last. They never brought her enough water. Too often she gulped it down and then spent the next day lying in her bed, daydreaming about diving into a lake with her mouth open, guzzling down as much as she wanted. She put the cup to her lips and took a dainty sip. When she set it back on the tray, she saw something new, something other than the half loaf of bread. There sat a bowl of soup. Verna reverently lifted it, inhaling the aroma. It was a thin onion broth, but it seemed a queen's feast. Nearly in tears with joy, she took a swallow, savoring the rich flavor. She tore off a chunk of bread and dunked it in the soup. 
It tasted better than chocolate, better than anything she had ever eaten. She broke the rest of the bread into small pieces and dumped them all in the bowl. Swelling in the soup, it made the bread seem more than she could eat, but she did. As she ate, she worked the journey book from its pouch in her belt. Her hopes sagged again as there was no new message. She had told Anne what had happened, and she had received back a hastily scrawled message that said only, you must escape and get the sisters away. She had received no message since. After she had tipped up the bowl and drained the last of the soup, she blew out the candle, saving it for later. She put the half cup of water behind the candle so as to help ensure she wouldn't spill it in the dark, and then lay back on the pallet, rubbing her full stomach. She woke from a dead sleep when she heard the door lever clang as it was lifted. Verna put the back of a hand to her eyes, protecting them from the dazzling illumination that stabbed into the room. She scooted back against the wall as the door closed. A woman stood holding a lamp. Verna squinted in its blinding brightness. The woman set the lamp on the floor and straightened to fold her arms at her waist. She stood watching, saying nothing. Who is it? Who's there? Sister Leoma Marsic, came the terse reply. Verna blinked as her eyes finally acclimated to the lamplight. Yes, it was Leoma. Verna could make out her wrinkled face and long white hair hanging back over her shoulders. Leoma was the one in the prelate's office, the one who had put her in here. Verna sprang for the woman's throat. Confused for a moment, she realized she was sitting back on her pallet and her behind smarted from the rough landing. She felt the disturbing sensation of the Radahan preventing her from rising. She tried to move her legs, but they wouldn't respond. It was a singularly terrifying sensation. She gasped for air, fighting back a cry of panic. She stopped trying to fight it, to stand, and the alarm eased. But the disquieting, extrinsic feeling didn't. That will be quite enough, Verna. Verna made sure her voice was under control before she spoke. What am I doing in here? You were being held until your trial had concluded. Trial? What trial? No, she would not give Leoma the satisfaction. That would seem appropriate. Verna wished she could stand. It was shaming to have Leoma looking down upon her like this. And has it then? That is why I am here. I have come to inform you of the decision of the tribunal. Verna bit off her caustic reply. Of course, these traitors found her guilty of some fraudulent charge. And their decision, then? You have been found guilty of being a sister of the dark. Verna was struck speechless. She stared up at Leoma, but couldn't bring forth a word at the pain of having sisters convict her of that. She had worked nearly her whole life to see the Creator honored in this world. Rage boiled up, but she held it in check, remembering Warren's admonition about her temper. Sister of the dark. I see. And how could I have been convicted of such an accusation without evidence? Leoma chuckled. Come now, Verna. Surely you would not believe you could get away with such a high crime and leave no evidence. No, I suppose you managed to find something. Do you intend to tell me then, or did you simply come here to gloat over having at last managed to make yourself prelate? Leoma lifted an eyebrow. Oh, I have not been named prelate. Sister Ulyssia was chosen. Verna flinched. Ulyssia! Ulyssia is a sister of the dark! She fled with five of her collaborators! Quite to the contrary, sisters Tovi, Cecilia, Armina, Nietzsche, and Marissa have all returned and have been reinstated to their positions of authority as sisters of the light. Verna struggled mightily but unsuccessfully to rise to her feet. They were caught attacking Prelate Annalina! Ulyssia killed her! They all fled! Leoma sighed as if having to explain the most simple of things to an ignorant novice. And who caught them attacking Prelate Annalina? She paused. You. You and Richard. The six sisters have testified how they were attacked by a sister of the dark after Richard had killed Sister Liliana, and they fled for their lives until they could arrange their return in order to save the palace from your grip. The misunderstanding has been set straight. It was you, a sister of the dark, who masterminded that accusation. You and Richard were the only witnesses. It was you who killed Prelate Annalina. You and Richard Rahl, whom you then aided in escaping. We heard testimony by sisters who overheard you telling one of the guards, Kevin Andelmere, that he must be loyal to Richard, 
your accomplice, instead of the Emperor. Verna shook her head in disbelief. So you took the word of six of the Keeper's minions, and on that basis, because there are more of them than one of me, convicted me? Hardly. There were days and days of testimony and evidence presented. So much, in fact, that your trial has taken nearly two weeks. We wanted to make sure, in the interest of justice and considering the seriousness of the charges, that we were completely fair and thorough. A great number of witnesses came forth to reveal the extent of your nefarious work. Verna threw her hands up. What are you talking about? You have been methodically destroying the work of the palace. Thousands of years of tradition and effort have been overturned in your effort to bring the work of the Sisters of the Light to ruin. The problems you caused were extensive. The people in the city rioted because you had ordered the palace to halt payments to women who become pregnant by our young wizards. Those children are one of our main sources of boys with the gift. You wish to strangle that source. You stopped our young men from going to the city to see to their needs and produce those offspring with the gift. It came to a head last week when we had a riot that had to be put down by the guards. The people were about to storm the palace because of our cruelty in letting those young women and their children starve. Many of our young men joined in the uprising because you cut off their right to palace gold. Verna wondered just what the true nature of the uprising had been, considering that young wizards were involved. But she didn't think Leoma would be forthcoming with the truth of it. Verna knew that there were good men among those young wizards and feared their fate. Our gold corrupts the morals of everyone it touches, Verna said. She knew it was a waste to try to defend herself. This woman was not amenable to reason or the truth. It has worked for thousands of years, but of course you would not want the benefits of this design to come to fruit in order to aid the Creator. These orders have been reversed, as have others of your ruinous directives. You would not want us to be able to determine if young men were prepared to face the world. You want them to fail and so you disallowed the test of pain. That order, too, has been reversed. You have been defiling palace doctrine since the day you became prelate. You yourself are the one responsible for the prelate's death, and then you use your underworld tricks to install yourself as prelate so you may destroy us. You never listened to the advice of your advisors because you never had any intent of preserving the palace. You no longer even bother to look at reports but instead burden inexperienced administrators with your work while you lock yourself in your sanctuary to confer with the Keeper. Verna sighed. That's it, then? My administrators don't like having to work? Some avaricious people are unhappy because I refuse to hand out gold from the palace treasury simply because they choose to get pregnant rather than establish their own families to bring children into the world? Some sisters are disgruntled because I won't allow our young men to indulge in unrestrained self-gratification. The words of six sisters who flee rather than stay to be questioned are suddenly taken seriously? And you even name one of them prelate? All without so much as a single piece of hard evidence? A smile finally came to Leoma's lips. Oh, we have hard evidence, Verna. We do indeed, with a smug expression. She reached into a pocket and pulled out a piece of paper. We had some very hard, very condemning evidence, Verna. She solemnly unfurled the paper as her austere gaze again settled on Verna. And one other witness, Warren. Verna flinched as if she had been struck across the face. She recalled the messages she had received from the prelate and Nathan. Nathan had been in a panic that Warren must get away from the palace. Anne had been emphatic that Verna make sure Warren left at once. Do you know what this is, Verna? Verna dared not speak or even blink. I think you do. It's a prophecy. Only a sister of the dark would be so arrogant as to leave such an incriminating document lying about. We found it down in the vault stuffed in a book. Perhaps you've forgotten all about it? Let me read it then. When the prelate and the prophet are given to the light in the sacred rite, the flames will bring to boil a cauldron of guile and give ascension to a false prelate who will reign over the death of the palace of the prophets. Leoma folded the paper and slipped it back into her pocket. You knew Warren was a prophet, and you took off his collar. You let a prophet roam free, a grievous offense in itself. And what makes you think Warren gave this prophecy? Verna asked cautiously. 
Warren testified that he did. It took a while for him to decide to speak his guilt in giving prophecy. Verna's voice heated. What did you do to him? We used his Radahan, as is our duty, to elicit the truth. In the end, he confessed that the prophecy was his. His Radahan? You put a collar back on him? Of course. A prophet must be collared. As prelate, it was your duty to see it done. Warren is back in a collar and under shields and guard at the prophet's quarters, where he belongs. The palace of the prophets has once again been set back to the way it is meant to be. This prophecy was the final condemning piece of evidence. It proved the duplicity in your actions and revealed your true intent. Fortunately, we were able to act before you could bring the prophecy to fruition. You have failed. You know none of that is true. Warren's prophecy proves your guilt. It names you a false prelate and reveals your plans to destroy the palace of the prophets. Her smile returned. It created quite a stir when it was read before the tribunal. Quite a condemning piece of hard evidence, I would say. You vile beast. I will see you dead. I would expect no less from one such as you. Fortunately, you are in no position to make good on your threats. Looking up into Leoma's eyes, Verna kissed her ring finger. Why don't you kiss your finger, Sister Leoma, and beseech the Creator's help in this time of trouble for the Palace of the Prophets? Wearing a mocking smile, Leoma spread her hands. The palace has no trouble now, Verna. Kiss your finger, Leoma, and show the beloved creator your solicitude for the well-being of the Sisters of the Light. Leoma didn't bring her hands to her lips. She couldn't, and Verna knew it. I have not come here to pray to the creator. Of course not, Leoma. You and I both know that you're a sister of the dark, as is the new prelate. Ulyssia is the false prelate in the prophecy. Leoma shrugged. You, Verna, are the first sister ever to be convicted of such a high crime. There is no longer any doubt. The conviction cannot be overturned. We're alone, Leoma. No one can hear us behind all those shields, except, of course, one with subtractive magic. And you've no need to fear those ears. None of the true sisters of the light can hear anything we say. If I tried to tell anyone anything you might have to say, no one would believe me. So let's drop the pretense, Leoma. We both know the truth. A small smile spread onto Leoma's lips. Go on. Verna took a calming breath and folded her hands in her lap. You haven't killed me, as Ulyssia killed Prelate Annalina. You wouldn't have bothered to go through this whole sham if you intended to kill me. You could have killed me in my office. You obviously want something. What is it? Leoma chuckled. Ah, Verna, you always were one to cut right to the heart of the matter. You're not very old, but I must admit you are a smart one. Yes, I'm just brilliant. That's why I'm sitting here. What is it your master, the Keeper, wants you to get from me? Leoma pursed her lips. At the moment we serve another master. It is what he wants that is important. Verna frowned. Jakang, you've given an oath to him too? Leoma's gaze darted away for an instant. Not exactly, but that's beside the point. Jagang wants things, and he shall have them. It's my duty to see to it that he gets what he wants. And what is it you want from me? You must forsake your loyalty to Richard Rahl. You're dreaming if you think I'll do that. An ironic smile came to Leoma's face. Yes, I have been dreaming. But that too is beside the point. You must give up your bond to Richard. Why? Richard has a way of interfering with the Emperor's control of events. You see, loyalty to Richard blocks Jagang's power. He wishes to see if this loyalty can be broken so that he can enter your mind. It's an experiment of sorts. It's my task to convince you to forsake that loyalty. I'll do no such thing. You can't make me abandon my fidelity to Richard. Leoma's smile turned grim as she nodded. Oh, yes, I can, and I will. I have a great deal of motivation. <laughs>